call the North Reading School Committee meeting to order for Monday, February 26th. Uh, we recently, uh, we just completed an executive session. Uh, we met with uh, the superintendent and with Chief Michael Murphy of the Police Department. And I, I just wanted to say that um, after meeting and hearing from Mr. Bernard and Chief Murphy uh, regarding school safety and security, and I, I want to make clear, the reason why we discuss school safety and security in executive session is that if we revealed a lot of the things that we have in place for school safety and security, they would then become uh, ineffective. So um, we heard a lot from the chief. I do want to say that after the meeting, I can say that I, as a, as a school committee chairman, am completely confident that North Reading schools are safe today. In fact, both the chief and the superintendent made the statement to us that if they, if they felt that any school was not safe, the doors to that school um, the doors to that school would not be open. And the chief and superintendent stressed that we've worked not just because of the most recent incidents, both here at the school and in Florida and in other places, but that we've worked over the years to continue to, to improve our safety and security. There are a lot of things in place that you don't see. Uh, are we perfect? I don't think anybody is, and, and we're gonna continue to work to improve safety and security uh, as we move forward. And I don't know if any other committee members wanted to make a comment. I can open it at this time, anybody? I couldn't agree more with what <coughs> you just said. It was reassuring. Mr. Buckley? Uh, the only other thing I would add is just, we, we looked at the policies for various incidents and voted on them just a few weeks ago, and it was reassuring to hear that that committee that did all that work is going to stay together going forward to try to make sure that there were always looking at if there are things that can be improved and I guess on an ongoing basis. The last thing, which I should have said earlier on, was that the chief emphasized to us that over the last 10 to 12 years, the relationship between the school department and the police department has improved significantly. And he said that today they're working hand in hand, I think is basically the, the words he I used, I think his John. final words were that they've taken it to a new, new level, level of cooperation and collaboration between right. the school department and the police department. So I just wanted to, to make that known. So let's get to our agenda. First item, item of business, as always, is public input. So if anybody would like to be heard on any issue not uh, on the agenda, please make yourself known. Um, could you get? Yeah, not sure. <coughs> no, we should get, need to get you one of these microphones so you can be heard on. Uh, <coughs> just, Lana, just say your name and address when you get the mic. And <coughs> I know who you are, but I'm everybody else doesn't. Thankfully. <laughs> I am Lena Simone, and I live at 7 Deerfield Place, and I promise to be really, really brief. I really do. Um, I just wanted to ask two questions and just make a comment. So I'm actually going to start with the comment, if that's okay. I have a sixth grader. She's 12 years old. And what has been on, I think, a lot of people's mind, as evidenced by social media and many other places, the kids' conversations, is this school walkout on March the 14th. Um, I will say that I called Mr. Bernard this morning at 7.30, the poor man, and he literally called me back in five minutes to talk to me about it, which I greatly appreciate. Um, here is my thing. My daughter's only job is to go to school, get an education, and grow up to be a relatively good human being. And right now, unfortunately, she is very worried about being singled out because she is not going to be walking out on the 14th. And I know we focus a lot on anti-bullying here and making sure that everybody's opinions are heard and feel welcome, but she is very, very worried at this point. And I asked her, I said, well, why do you think people are walking out? And she said, well, because the teachers want us to. I said, no, that's absolutely not accurate. And the only reason I'm bringing that up is I think a lot of the younger kids, I'm not talking about the high school kids, the younger kids may not necessarily understand what's going on. So, um, you know, as I explained to Mr. Bernard, I'm trying to get her past it, past everything, past the incident here, past what happened in Florida. It's tough to do if it keeps being pushed to the forefront. Um, so my question is, what's the school's position on it? and what will the teacher's instructions be? And also what happens the next time that there is some sort of a protest? I know there's scheduled to be, there is scheduled to be one on April the 20th. Thankfully, we will not be in school that day, but 
they may come out with another day? Or what if there's something else that many people don't agree with that's a protest, but you let this one happen, then what do you do? I'm only throwing it out there. It's a little bit of a slippery slope, so. So, okay. so I, I think that um, we don't always uh, answer questions uh, when they're in public session, we say, we'll get back to you later. But I think at this point, I think it is important. I can tell you that um, Julie raised the issue today with me and, and with Mr. Bernard, and I know Mr. Bernard has had some meetings. Um, I don't know if uh, we have any um, policy announcement to make or any, or any um, decision on what our, um, you know, what our attitude or what our um, official policy is gonna be toward this, but I think Mr. Bernard should um, fill us in on what's gone on today. I can, I can, I can do that to the extent that I have, you know, information that I think is valuable enough to make sense at this point because it is all, you know, fairly fresh. Um, but I did have two meetings today. Um, last Thursday, <clears throat> anticipating that when we came back to school today that there would, you know, there would be um, some questions around the, the, the walkout movement, and so I had, I had asked for the administrators to make themselves available um, to meet with me at 10 o'clock this morning, and so we did that. Um, and and I, would, I think it's fair to say that the, the, the discussion focused, the hour and 15 or so minutes that we were together, the, the discussion focused largely on, on where we were with responding to questions about um, any kind of an action, a walkout, or whatever movement, you, you know, whatever term you want to use to, to classify the, the movement. I shared with them um, a number of documents, I think there were six or seven in all, um, that I had kind of culled over the course of the last couple of days. Our, my, my professional organization, the state association and such, um, we had been sharing um, documents with each other, you know, to kind of help guide us a little bit, and some of them came from a national organization as well, um, where, you know, we may not have experienced something like this um, in Massachusetts that other, other states had. And I think there was some value in some of those those documents that that we discussed briefly. Um, the The second meeting I had, which was a little bit later in the day, was a previously scheduled meeting with the student representatives to the school committee, of which Caitlin is here and is one of them. And the subject came up, and and I brought the high school principal into that meeting, um, and we talked a little bit further with the students about about um, I'll say their desire, at least what we're hearing is a desire to acknowledge in some way, um, you know, what's gone on and to kind of, you know, in tandem work with, you know, each other as, as, as students in the administration to, to, um, to do some sort of a, of, a, of a demonstration, if you will. Whatever that is right now, I don't know, um, because we set a meeting for Wednesday. And so we're going to then involve the, um, the class offices from the four grades at the high school in that meeting on, on Wednesday. Um, so my ex expectation is that there will be, uh, there's more to come. And we, we set the meeting for Wednesday because we know we don't have a lot of time. And I think the students that we met with today were um, extremely responsible in their approach in that um, I, think they were, I think they were looking to gauge the, the, the feelings of the administration. And, and because I think there's a lot of uncertainty right now among, <laughs> among young people about you know, how are their schools going to respond to students if they do do something, whatever that is, a walkout or some other, some other uh, action. And I, I, I hope the students walked away today feeling that we were receptive to working with them and, and, and to plan and organize something um, that would capture the spirit of what the whole, um, the day is supposed to be on March 14th, but, and at the same time respecting that, um, you know, we don't want to heighten people's anxiety with just some kind of, you know, free for all. And I think what, what came out of what we had talked about today, I think the, the salient point was is to have a second meeting about planning. Sure. Um, we were also very mindful of um, this being a shared campus and what the implications are for middle school age students. All of the principals were in the meeting that I had this morning. Um, we talked about how there might be some different age appropriate actions at, at an elementary school that would not be, you know, analogous to a, to a walkout. So we just, we just don't know right now, but I think it's fair to say that, I'll speak for myself, but I think the other administrators agree that um, where we are today and how people are feeling and the desire on young people's part to exercise a voice is important and I, I certainly respect that and I'm willing to work with them to give them a vehicle to do that in the way that I think is both respectful um, and appropriate. And so I think that's, you know, there's more to come, um, I think, in the coming days. Um, 
it's it's still very fresh for us right now, you know. But I, I anticipated that there would be something, um, some discussion, which is why I felt the administrators and I should meet first, and we did that at 10 o'clock today. John, if, if I can ask, will, will we, um, will the school administration, this is what I hope you'll do, and but it's your decision, take an, an official position, and, and also, you know, to kind of follow up on Lena's behalf, um, if we take a position that says, you can have a walkout for 17 minutes or whatever, whatever that position is. But we also need to take a position that if students don't want to participate, yeah. they have a hundred percent right not to participate and not to feel uncomfortable if they're not participating. I, I, I can, guess that's, that's yeah. I can speak to those two things. I think the first is when we when the administrators left the meeting this morning, I asked each of them to go back and communicate to their staff that we had met and that they could expect more direction coming from me at some time, okay? That we, why we met today, that we acknowledged, you know, that there was, um, you know, I think a strong uh, desire on the part of the administration to have that conversation, to communicate to people that we had had that meeting, that they would hear more from me, um, that's issue one. When we met with the students today, we talked very specifically about um, kind of, you know, a, you know, we're using the word a pledge, I think, now, right, of students to, I'm sorry, Caitlin, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, we talked about um, students pledging by signing that they, so we could, because the administration feels like we need to have a sense of the level of participation so that we know what the level of non-participation is, too, and what alternative is going to be available. So, you know, I think, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I neglected to say that, but that's, we, we talked very much about so, a sort of a record keeping, if you will, because we realized that there, number one, we don't want, you know, and I don't know what level of adult participation we might have either. So we have to, that's why there's a need, I think, to coordinate this so it isn't just, you know, that we don't defeat the purpose of what we're trying to do by having it be something that wasn't, um, that wasn't carefully and thoughtfully thought out, so. So will you expect to release uh, some sort of position or I think so. before, yeah. before March meeting, 14th? Before March 14th? Uh, I don't know if it'll be before, before you know, I, I think that there'll be a, you know, I think it's only fair that the community know where, where we are as a district. Right. In, because this is, this is, I mean, I've been doing this for 32 years. I remember a walkout when MCAS came in yep. um, at the school I was working at at the time. But this is, I've seen nothing like this ever. Um, so I think, you know, people was need Lena to, at that walk people no, need to, that was Pac. Oh, that was, <laughs> as soon as I said it, I knew that was a bad example. I really did, but okay. sorry, it's the only other walkout I'm, I'm familiar with, it's okay. <laughs> but I, I think it's only fair because I think there is so much, there are so many questions around this because it is different for a lot of people. I think it's only fair that something come from me that explains what we're doing, um, I'm just going to ask for people's patience because it's, you so know, I think it's a it's great issue deep. to raise. I think, I mean, I feel comfortable that we're taking all that into consideration. You know, you can't ever be 100% perfect when you're trying to have one kid not, you know, pick on another, whatever. but I think we're going to do everything we can to, if students don't want to walk out, there's yeah. another activity they can go to. I think that, you know, that's a good start right there. While the kids are walking out, there's something that they can do and that we have to respect everybody's <laughs> rights whether they want to participate or not. No Just question. the supervision of all of that and, you know, what ki who's outside, who's inside mm -hmm. and getting back and rounding kids up and I think that's important to be yeah. in the plan. I have great confidence in our students and their ability to work with us Good. because I think they know that we want to work with them. And because we're, you know, accommodating that, I think they're accommodating us and I think they clearly my 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 belief is and and I feel very strongly that they will, because of, because of what this demonstration is tied to and this, the, the kind of the, the seriousness of it, I think they know that this is, you know, this is something that in order for it to be effective and meaningful needs to be done right. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I think all of those ideas of supervision and coordination and um, you know, respect for the cause are, are things that we will be you know, discussing with them in the coming days. Anything else, Lena? Um, no, I guess the only thing I wanted to mention is just about, um, I mentioned it briefly, but I'm a fast talker, so I apologize. I just would, I, it's not a question for today, but just something to maybe mull about um, what happens when if there's something else that comes up. Obviously, this is a gigantic magnitude that everyone's affected by, completely different, but, you know, 
can the school say, okay, this one's okay, but you can't, you know, you're not, you don't get, not that I want kids to get disciplined, but I'm just saying, you know, this one's okay, but this one's not down the road. I just right, I want to make sure the school gets protected too. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. Anybody else have anything that they'd like to discuss that's not on the agenda as part of public input? Okay. So at this time, <clears throat> we will move to our student, and now she's already she's already on the uh, on the spot here with a answering questions. We're going to move to our student report, and tonight we have Caitlin Galvin, who's a member of the class of 2018. Caitlin. Okay, so of course we're just back from break, but we're jumping right back into things because winter sports seasons are wrapping up, so we've got tournaments, we've got all sorts of clubs holding different fundraisers, so it's a pretty busy time. In terms of academic, academics, AP government classes went on a field trip to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute right before vacation. They had the chance to be involved in a mock Senate session and successfully approved a cabinet nominee and passed comprehensive immigration legislation. It was actually the same day that the actual Senate voted on it and did not pass Im immigration legislation, so we did better than them. Um, American legal classes will be going on a field trip to the Suffolk County Jail on March 9th. And the economics and honors government classes will be going on a field trip to the JFK Library in March to learn about budgeting. Um, the guidance department has also released the Dollars for Scholars application, which is due April 1st. And guidance is also, um, is also beginning the course selection process for the 2018-2019 school year. And um, the Model United Nations team is back from their trip to Harvard Model United Nations. It was a really great conference and it was a great learning experience on a number of topics from globalization to the Vietnam War. Michael Tyrell took home an honorable mention award for his work as Tribune of the Plebs in the um, Roman Senate. It's only the second time North Reading has taken home an award at this competition and it's actually Mike's second time. In his um, committee, he succeeded in um, beating out Julius Caesar to form the first triumvirate, which i still not sure how he did that. <laughs> um, and then the Academic Decathlon team attended their regionals competition a few weeks ago with three members, Laura Wagner, Michael Tyrell, and myself competing in the small school's honors division. The team collectively took home 13 awards in various events. Laura won bronze in music. I won bronze in the interview and speech events, as well as gold in the essay and overall subjective events, and came in fifth overall. Michael took home bronze in economics and essay, silver in overall subjective events, as well as gold in math, social science, and the speech event. Michael was also named the team's top scorer and took home fourth overall in our division. And in fine arts, Maskers is competing at prelims on Sunday against seven other schools in Chelmsford. They'll be performing one man, two governors. And um, North Reading High School hosts the semifinals on March 10th, so Maskers is hoping to make it to that semifinal. Well, that's, that's really cool, because I know last year we hosted the prelims, so it's, it's great that we're hosting the semifinals. That's awesome. So for athletics, the winter sports season is almost finished. Our girls basketball team finished 15 and five, finishing off the regular season with a huge win against Pentucket. They're the fifth seed in the D2 MIAA tournament. Their first playoff game is home Wednesday at 7 p.m. against Hamilton Wenham, and they're really hoping for a large crowd. They also had two players named All-Stars, Casey McAuliffe and Lawrence Sullivan. Ali Grasso, a sophomore, was also named an All-Conference player, which is the top 12 players in the Cape Ann League as voted on by the coaches. Our boys basketball team had a, also had a great season, but finished just shy of making the tournament. Senior Colin Boucher was named a first team all-star, and junior Matt Selecki was named a second team all-star. Our swim team had a strong season as well. On the girls side, several athletes placed within the top three at Cal's, with uh, six then qualifying for sectionals. Christina Valenti, Kaya Gabar, and uh, Molly Pfeffer also qualified for states where they all had top 30 finishes in their respective events. Um, on the boys team finished fifth in Cal's with senior Owen DeClean finishing second in the 100 meter freestyle and had an impressive season overall despite the team being small in number. Boys hockey team finished the season 9, 8, and 3 and are seeded 16th in states. They have their first playoff game tonight against Essex Tech. They also won the Jeff Hayes Memorial Tournament this past week with goalie Justin DePlatzi named tournament to the tournament all team and Kevin Murphy named tournament MVP. Girls track has had a very successful season as well, winning the state title for the first time in Northern High School history, even after moving up from Division Five to Division Four. All states was this past Sunday where several North Reading athletes competed as well. Boys track also competed at states and numerous athletes performed well, but the team did not place. Our ski team had a strong building season with senior Zoe Kennedy qualifying as an alternate for states. 
and our cheerleading team has had a really strong year, which included a trip to nationals in Dallas, Texas. They also placed first at Shawshin Tech Invitational, and the Cape Ann League Championship was actually last night, where they placed first and will be moving on to the regional competition this Sunday in Methuen. The girls' hockey team, which is combined with Peabody and Linfield, is 11-7-2 and, and has made it to the state tournament. First playoff game is Wednesday at 8 in, at Connery Arena in Lynn. Freshman Sammy Marisolo was named league MVP, and seniors Cassie Marisolo, Katie Purcell, <coughs> Maya Norton, as well as junior goalie Abby Buckley were named league all-stars. Wrestling finished their season out strong. Two members of the Linfield North Reading team made it to states, and senior Andrew DiPietro and sophomore Sean McCullough were named alternates to states in their respective weight classes. And the gymnastics team, which is combined with Danvers, has had a successful season as well. Caroline Boucher, a junior, made it to the individual all-around st at states, and Jenna D'Ambrosio made it to states for vault. And in terms of clubs and other activities, SAD recently organized a Start With Hello Week at North Reading High School. This is led by the parents of the victims at Sandy Hook and works to prevent social isolation. Events included encouraging students to wear green and pasting sticky notes with encouraging messages around the school. And Student Council has a number of events coming up. Uh, this Thursday, Stuco will be hosting an administrative luncheon during Power Block. And Student Council will also be participating in the Polar Plunge. And several members will be heading to the Senior Center again on Tuesday to host iPhone learning sessions. This is the second time they're doing this. There will also be several Stuco members attending the state conference in Hyannis next Wednesday. They are currently rehearsing a lip sync, lip sync routine entitled The Evolution of Bruno Mars to perform at the conference. Um, student Council will continue to campaign for Duncan McNeil to become Massachusetts Student Council President at the Hyannis Conference. His campaign is, of course, Duncan Donuts themed with the slogan, Stuco Runs on You. <laughs> also, every year at the Massachusetts Student Council State Conference, student councils from each town nominate their choice for Administrator of the Year. This year, Mr. Bernard was named Administrator of the Year by the State Conference and will join NRHS Stuco and Hyannis for the awards banquet where he will be presented with his award. And finally, Interact will be organizing Pennies for Patients beginning March 5th. Interact will be collecting donations for the month for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. This year, our goal is $1,000. Students can donate in their power blocks or online. Donations could be more than just pennies. Parents can also donate online as well using a link that will be sent out on social media and in the daily notices. It's a great cause, and we'd really appreciate donations. So what you're saying, there's not much going on. <laughs> Wow, that was really, really good. Yeah. I think the Boston Globe's looking for a sports. We got to get our student. We got to get our student work, though. Yeah, I yeah. Know. I mean, Still, so, this is a um, project I had to do as part of my AP World History class, and um, basically we were asked to do a project kind of on the Middle Ages in general. We could pick any topic. Some people picked like um, monks. Uh, my group picked knights and kind of like chivalry, and we could do any format we wanted. It just couldn't be a PowerPoint. It had to be creative. So we chose to do a journal, and so we came up with a fictional um, French soldier and um, kind of wrote a journal for him going through the process of becoming a knight, and so this is what we made. Great. So echoing what Jerry said, that might have been the most yeah. comprehensive and in-depth uh, student report I mean, you we've ever seen. Say, well, Maybe she'll miss out something on the girls' hockey team or something, yeah. but you got it all. So, <laughs> so Caitlin, I, I'm not putting you on the spot, but I did, you know, just to follow up on what Mr. Bernard said in terms of the students kind of being respectful and working with the administration in terms of this March 14th thing. You're obviously a student leader. You, you feel confident and comfortable that the students are going to work hand in hand with the administration on this, on this event? Yeah, I can speak personally from it because I had, um, as I told in the meeting we had today, I had a friend approach me a couple, uh, as a group that really wanted to do it and really wanted to get out ahead. And the first thing we wanted to do is how can we kind of make sure the administration is on board with this and make sure it's not just chaos on the 14th. And so we kind of, I feel like the students have been very responsible in terms of their outlook. Like the reason we turned to a pledge is because we wanted students to be aware of why they're walking out. We didn't want it to just be a free for all. We wanted, we want this to be a learning experience. Cause like I know you mentioned your sixth grader, my sister's also in her grade. And I asked my sister like, do you understand what this is about kind of what's going on? And we want it for high school to everyone that to understand kind of as a learning experience, why it's important to do this and why it's meaningful. Even if they choose not to, the, just the concept of using your voice politically is I think something we wanted to bring across. And I feel like the students have been very good about 
being responsible in that regard, recognizing that there's different sides and that not everyone's going to want to do it and that we need to work with the administration because that was the first thing we did today was make sure we were going to approach the administration. And I think having uh, been on the committee for 14 years and working with student leaders, that's basically the answer I expected. Very mature, very responsible. I, I think she could be president someday. I really do. <laughs> She's got to be 35, though, I think, doesn't she? You have a number of years you have to work. But, uh, you know, John? I just had, at the risk of, and I certainly don't intend to embarrass Caitlin, but I did want to acknowledge while she was here tonight that um, you, I did previously um, inform the committee that she was a semifinalist in the National Merit Scholar Qualifying Test, and she has now been named a finalist. Wow. It is, it is a very distinct honor. Yes. Um, my recollection of the program from when I was a high school principal is there were 15,000 uh, 15, students across the country that make it to the, the finalist level, which Caitlin, you've done your, have you done your packet already for the scholarship with guidance? Have you, have you submitted anything to qualify you for the scholarship? For the scholarship, yeah. yes. So there's, a, there's the potential for, I believe it's about 50% of the students can earn a scholarship of $2,500. And, um, you know, Caitlin's presentations to you this year as a student rep, I think, are just a very small glimpse into the person that she is and the student that she's been here at the high school. She's been a, you know, a wonderful contributing member of the student body, and I think, um, this is, this is just another accolade on, on, on what I, I think are going to be quite a few more coming before she graduates here in June. So congratulations. Right. Yes, that's great. Congrats, congratulations. congratulations to you, too, Mr. Brown. Yes. You told me you weren't going to bring it up today. Congratulations. Could you please you told me you weren't going to bring it up. <laughs> We'd like to see the qualifications of that administrator. <laughs> with we, uh, we're a little bit skeptical of that here. So, so I will be in Hyannis on the night of the 8th. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> with our school committee, they'll be down. Well, I mean, uh, I think school council will be down there. The student, there. The student council will be. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sitting with them. Yes, yeah, so the dinner. Is that a work day or a vacation? It's at night. Oh, okay. It's at night. So. Anything else for Caitlin? Great. Thanks very much. Right. Appreciate it. So, Mr. Bernard, can we um, switch around the agenda here and get? We have three different okay. groups. Oh. I want to get Owen first, and I mean, I know Owen from his the many great roles he's played in uh, hmm. the many great musicals and plays and maskers, but he's here in a different. Uh, role tonight. So we have Owen DeClean to talk about his uh, Eagle Scout project. Mike, do you want to put that microphone on? Yes. Yeah. Should we go up there? To, uh, can you get, I want to get my email down. You threw me a curveball, Owen. I was looking. I wasn't ready to have your uh, email up here. I guess while we're setting it up, I can start talking. Oh, and make sure you talk into this mic so they can hear you on cable TV. And being the actor that you are, I'm sure you can project, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Lots of projection. So my name is Owen DeClean. I am a senior here at North Reading High School. Um, and I'm also, hopefully, soon going to be an Eagle Scout. Um, today I would like to present to you guys uh, the project that I did here at the school. I made trash can enclosures for down uh, by the sports fields. Um, so here we go. The, how does this work? Nope. Uh, let's see. Can I just scroll? There we go. Yeah. So the previous trash barrels that we have down at the sports fields are these big plastic barrels, which work fine for collecting trash. But I thought that since we have these beautiful new facilities, we should uh, try to beautify them more. Also, I noticed that the custodial staff, whenever it rains or snows, uh, these have to come inside because they are open at the top and we don't want them to flood with water. So the, the concept that I, uh, I drew up the plans, I organized all the materials, and what I got was um, to build these uh, wooden houses for the trash cans. Um, so I had about 20 different people helped me, all the way from sixth graders in our schools, seniors, and even alumni from North Reading High School. Um, we spent a total of about 124.25 man hours. This includes not only the actual construction, but the building, the meeting with Mr. Bernard, Mr. Hardacre, um, and different people from the scout troop. All of this combined um, was, constitutes my Eagle project. Uh, here you can see that's a sixth grader and me, so a huge age gap. <laughs> and then um, in our garage was filled with lovely volunteers that were helping me with my project. 
the final products that we have, you can see here, um, we have two houses here. They have a front door. The barrels that we already have will slide in there. So this is not a replacement, but something that will help us out. Um, these can also move around. They're not permanent structures. So down at the sports field, we can uh, put them wherever they seem to be best, whether it's around the parking lot or on either ends of the football field or around the softball field. This can help us out. Also, these can stay out in the weather. So we, they don't have to come in anymore. Uh, they have a shingled roof, and it's all pressure-treated materials. So we're good in that aspect. Um, finally, I would like to thank some special people. Um, Mr. Lepret was the first one I went to uh, when I had the idea. He lined me up. He told me to talk to Mr. Bernard and Mr. Hardacre. Both of these, uh, I then went to Mr. Hardacre. He was very supportive. He showed me the many different ways that I had to go in order to get approval. Um, and finally, Mr. Bernard especially, uh, he was extremely supportive. He helped me uh, organize fundraising when I uh, was set up a GoFundMe account. He tweeted it out to everybody in the district. So that was extremely uh, important to me. Uh, and lots of people from the school, including people that are here tonight, uh, donated on that to, uh, GoFundMe account. And I would like to thank everybody very much for that. Um, thank you. So, so before you sit down, yes. Owen, is, he's a, just another prime example of the kind of kids we have that we produce in our school system. They, they care about the community, they care about the school, and they care about doing good. And oh, and the one thing I would suggest is I'd, I'd love to maybe put a contract out for you to do these for every barrel we have outside because, I mean, this is one, it'll probably want, there'll be less bees down at the soccer field when I'm trying to watch a soccer game there. And, and that, for that alone, I'm, I'm pleased. But I'm sure Wayne's crew is happy that they're not gonna have to be emptying barrels of water and ice and snow, et cetera. Um, and I do want to say I'm going to miss you in, uh, in your roles that you've played with the maskers. I just think you've been, you've been tremendous over the years. So, uh, but this is great, and we really appreciate it. Anybody else have any comments? Well, if you, um, so right now they're not stained, but I'm going to come back. Um, since it's pressure-treated wood, I thought I should mention that um, uh, we're not supposed to stain it right away. So when, in the spring, I'm going to come back with some more kids from the troop, and we will officially stain them. Yes. Any other comments or questions for Owen, Julie, Sergeant, Janine? How many of the Boy Scouts and the younger volunteers and stuff um, helped you on this? Um, we had one sixth grader. Um, I think that was it from middle school. And then we had students. Um, we had several freshmen, uh, sophomores, and seniors. Um, I don't have, I think we were 18 as a total. Great. So it was really great participation. Um, and not even all of the high school students were um, in scouting. We had alumni and um, my sister <laughs> help out. I don't know if she counts, but. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you oh, so the, much. The only comment I would have is just, can you explain maybe very quickly, because be, becoming an Eagle Scout is quite an accomplishment on its own. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe tell us like a little bit of like, what's the criteria to become an Eagle Scout? Yeah. So. Uh, the Eagle Project is obviously the biggest thing that people think of when they think of an Eagle Scout. Um, but it's, we, we have to get a lot of merit badges that are from uh, a variety of topics, everything from citizenship in the community, uh, which actually entails coming to one of these meetings. Uh, I've already done that, though. <laughs> um, and then everything from cooking, uh, personal fitness. So a good Eagle Scout is someone, in my opinion, is just somebody who's a good person. So anybody who uh, knows how to live their life is, will, will do a good turn daily, does, is prepared, lives by a scout oath and law, can be an Eagle Scout. The rest of it is just buckling down, having parents who tell you to stop watching YouTube and do your Eagle project. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Uh, and I'll confirm that uh, I think uh, Owen is a good all-around person for sure, um, based on everything he's done at the school. So thanks very much. It's a great project. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here we come back. Thanks, Owen.
Okay, do we, John, do we want to move to, we have both Wayne and the, the drug guy. Uh, I think Amy. I don't think Amy, would you like to present next on the survey? Did you do Amy? The drug survey? <laughs> drug and alcohol use? You don't have a The first time it was that, should we? Just you. <laughs> Jerry, we, I think, do you have a presentation or no? No. Oh, she doesn't? No. No, you can sit wherever you want. Good, I want to sit back. No, I don't think so. Would you have a copy? They each have it the first time. Yeah. The iPhone class? I have it right there. So next we have Amy Lukowitz and Luckwitz, and she's going to present on the Drug Free Communities Grant Core Management Survey. Yes, I shall. That was pretty good. That's why I go by Lucky. Is it Luckowitz or Lukowitz? How do you? It's, it's Luckowitz. Luckowitz. Or Luskevich. Luskevich. Oh, okay. So that's. Right. Change your name to like Joan Luckowitz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My dad taught high school for 40 years, so he was Mr. Lucky. Lucky. That's yeah, good. Yeah, we go by Lucky. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm here to seek your blessing on administering our second core measurement survey related to the Drug Free Communities Grant. Um, I just wanted to highlight, you have a copy of the survey in front of you, and I'll go over a couple of key points. It's going to be um, hopefully administered to grades 6 through 12, similar as, la uh, as last year, as well as parents of grades 6 through 12. Um, and this is important. So taking perception of risk or harm specifically with parents versus students is important. So one thing that we look for is a good example is, let's take alcohol for example, is if we look at what students are actually using for alcohol and what the parents perception of use is. That really does tell us some information about where we need to focus our efforts. So technically the survey only really has to be for grant purposes uh, 16 questions and that's four questions about four different substances, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana and prescription drugs and the four required questions are past 30-day use, perception of risk or harm, uh, perception of peer approval and perception of parent approval related to those substances. But I'm happy to tell you that we're going to take it one step further and we're going to complete the survey on five substances and this is a change over last year's survey that you approved. A national trend is to lump vaping products with tobacco and nicotine. And that is a national standard. It has been for a long time. And I think it speaks to the misinformation out there about what vaping is. And we are taking, since we're going to be deviating from um, the administrator of last year's survey, we're, we have some flexibility on that. So we're going to separate out vaping. And that's really important to us. Uh, this will be setting a baseline for vaping. So we're not going to be able to compare it to last year's numbers. But we're really looking forward because that is a trend that we're seeing amongst uh, many grade levels and adult use as well. So this is important to us. So that's one of the key major changes for this year. The second major change is that we'll be switching from a paper format to an electronic format. Beyond the fact that it's going to save us paper, um, be more ecologically friendly, it's going to be saving us some funds related to the Drug Free Communities Grant. Previously, we had to pay for an evaluator, and that cost was uh, between $1,200 and $1,400, based on my memory. Uh, this year, we're going to an electronic version. We're paying for the full pro level of SurveyMonkey, and we're also paying um, our, we hired our, inter our summer intern to be a, an evaluator. He loves data ma management, and he's done a stellar job for us in the past. It also is going to give us quicker survey results, so we're really excited about that. Um, one of our concerns about switching to electronic form, though, and Mr. Bernard and I have talked lengthy about this, is the, the students' and parents' perception of confidentiality. And the way that this is going to work, and the benefit of using SurveyMonkey, is that I will be the only person that will have the code until I hand it over to our summer intern to download the data. This is not anything that the school is going to have access to, and it's not going to come from their Google account or their Google Forms account. <laughs> Although the survey link will come to their school email, um, it won't, the school won't have any direct access to it. So I'm just a little bit concerned about making sure that we put that message forward to the students that it's going to be a confidential survey. I'm not going to go back and check to see who didn't do it to send them reminders. We're not able to, that would be violating the confidentiality. So they will likely get a second reminder just to the general population as well as the parents. So I'll pause there. So just so we have, we are required to do this in order to continue to receive the grant from the federal government. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. And to be honest with you, it also really shapes what the coalition does. Uh, you know, we 
previously our first grant was written to focus on we're required to identify at least two substances that we want to focus on and they could pick anything including things that are not really um, statistically relevant here like meth and we used our data that was available at the time to focus on marijuana and prescription drugs but after last year's survey we saw that we really need to refocus on marijuana and alcohol well i was going to say that even if we weren't required to do this i think we should be doing this every year anyway mm -hmm. so i mean that's just my personal feeling thank you uh, uh, another addition this year has been we the police department reviewed this chief murphy added in some questions related to source of substances <coughs> just to help us uh, know where things are coming from. A good example of that is we suspect that a lot of alcohol use is coming from um, adults, but also from older siblings. So we'll be able to get a little bit more information about that. Okay. Any other questions before well, Scott? The only comment I had, which it, again, it's kind of out of place, but it seemed <laughs> the, the question about suicide number 10, mm -hmm. I mean, like most of this is about drug and alcohol use, and I, obviously it can be related, yes. but. It just can you talk a little bit about why that is in there as well? Because that's the one thing that seemed slightly out of place from all the other questions. And to your point, it might be out of place in the location of it specifically too. Um, we're really trying to get to questions about mental health in that question, and I believe there's some more questions if you go through related to that. Um, you know, substance use and suicide um, can be co-occurring. Uh, depression as well and so I think we were looking at to find some correlation between those who are feeling suicidal and to see if they're actively actively using to your point though I think the location might be a Julie? better spot just reviewing this it seems really long mm -hmm. and I think the choices that students can make I don't know the format and what that would look like whether that would be like a drop-down menu or it just seems really long to me. Yeah. And I don't know, and the organization of it, I feel like if a student is answering questions, let's say on nicotine use, or maybe just vaping, all of those questions should be kind of grouped somewhat together, just because it's fresh on their mind and they're thinking about it. Is there a reason why things are separated out? So there's two trains of thought on that. Um, some of the training that we've received through CADCA indicates that if you mix up the uh, topic of questions, let me put it this way, a better way. If we're for filling out surveys and we just kind of think like, yes, always, 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 not re really reading the question, but you know that if it's all lumped together, my answer is going to be similar. That's why it's, it's mixed up, so that you have to be forced to almost read the question. Okay. Um, your other point about being long, it's actually only, I think, a couple questions longer than last year's. It's just we did have, it was all on one page, so it looked different to you. Okay. It was double-sided, and it was in a, in a matrix format. The format online will be also matrix. Okay. Okay. The Go ahead. only other concern I had was ethnic origin and, and even potentially gender. In North Reading, we have a very homogeneous population. My only concern is if... <coughs> somebody puts that they're a minority of any sort, are we singling them out? I mean, again, it, most people aren't getting this, but the idea is to be, you know, private and confidential with this information. And mm -hmm. are you, by asking, asking ethnic origin, are you in any way singling out those, any individuals? So let me address gender first. Yep. Um, and <laughs> the gender question is actually quite important to us, and that is because we, nationally, there's a trend for more, more girls to vape. And we wanted to see if that trend is applying here, but also to other questions. Related to um, ethnicity, it'll be in context of the whole answer. So for example, if we have two um, people answer an ethnicity other than Caucasian, it's going to come up as a percentage. And so we'll, we'll use our brains to kind of say, okay, is this a trend or is it just indicating two people or 2%? Um, we can certainly eliminate that for purposes of the grant. I'm not that interested in it, but it might be interesting for other questions related to mental health and access to mental health. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the only concern I had was just singling people out by, by that. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the point. In that question um, did match last year's. It's the same options. So there's about, what is it, about 1,350 students between grades 6 and 12? Uh, a little bit more. Okay, and, and this, is, this is completely voluntary, right? Yes, there is a, um, an opt-out by way of not, yeah, it'll, be, it'll say in the introduction that you do not have to do it. And how many responses did we get last year? Do you, do you Great question. I don't know, remember. 
What's, what's Enough a, to be statistically so, valid. I'll say, what's a good, what's a good, what do you need to be statistically? So we actually have that at our statistician right now, giving him the exact numbers by grade so that he can figure that out okay. for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else? No. You have anything else? The, my only question, the follow-up on, on the ethnic one is for gender, there's a prefer not to say, mm -hmm. not to answer. Yeah, why isn't there maybe that? Maybe that could be an option as well. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. if somebody too. was worried about being identified. Yep. Julie? Just as far as those kind of mental health type questions, like the bullying, the safety, um, if I assume school personnel have looked those questions over and they're okay with those questions. Mr. Bernard has. Okay. And, and each principal. Oh, um, have they, yes, yeah. they have. Both yeah. principals did too. So um, while we have you here, and yeah. I, believe, I believe we have to take a vote on this to approve it, correct? Um, yes. Uh, this is off topic a little bit, but today there was a lot of news out, and I don't know who released the report, if it was the American Psychiatric Society, somebody um, recommending mandatory screening for all um, teens for, for depression and, and mental health issues. Just, just curious as to your, you've been around this for a while, but what, what's, your, what's your feedback? Because I think it would be great, but I also think it wouldn't be great if we don't have a system in place to care for those kids that we identify as having issues. I'm just curious as to your. You gave my answer. So it's all great to do um, screenings, but if there's no plan in place to respond to a positive screen, then what do we do from there? And um, you can't put the cart before the horse. I think it is really important. Um, it's also important to have, uh, you know, trained professionals doing that screening and it's consistent. So in my experience, what I've seen is um, some of that, can, some of it can be subjective. Right, so it's it's based on how you're presenting right in the moment, and that doesn't always give us a clear picture. So that's my other concern: is that if I'm just getting a, a snapshot of Mr. Webster at this moment right now on a Monday night, is that really giving me an entire picture? Um, and also, some of the key indicators and red flags of depression and mental health issues are not going to necessarily present in front of a professional in the moment. Right. So, it's a it's a good concept. I think that the intent behind it is positive, and I'm in for I'm I'm in for in favor of raising awareness wherever we can about it. I, I am too. The the other concern I have is um, like a lot of things, I'm afraid that they'll dump this on the schools, not give us any money, and expect us to implement it. It's very important, but it it would just be one more thing that we're trying to implement without any funds to implement it. And I just that that concerns me also. But I I think it's in the right direction. So I I just wanted to bring that up. Well, if that comes up. <laughs> I, I always like to say this, you know, we have this uh, federal grant for five years, we're in year number two, and every year we readjust the budget based on the needs of the community, and mental health issues fall in that um, framework. Great. Not, I can't give you $125,000 towards it, right. but I could certainly earmark some um, assistance for the public schools should things like that or SBIRT cost some money. Um, you know, we've had this conversation That's and I'm happy. To know. That's great. Happy to you know earmark some of that those funds moving forward. Keeping in mind that um, the, it's a federal grant and we've only been told we'll get it for five years and our president has threatened to cut it three times already. Right. So. Any other questions for Amy at this time? Do we have the ability to stop her from changing positions? No, I don't think we do. No. Okay. It's kind of already happened. <laughs> <laughs> you sure you can't give us 125,000? I'm pretty sure about that, but I am happy to uh, continue to grant write. Okay. All right. At this time, I will entertain a motion to on uh, the to approve uh, the administration administering of the core management survey for grades six through twelve in North Reading schools. Second. No. Oh, you so, looking for a motion? Oh. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> motion by Julie. Second by Janine. Any further discussion, Scott? Well, the only thing is, I would like to add in the 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 prefer not to say. Noted. I option. would too. Yeah. Okay, so okay. as long as the motion is contingent upon okay. that change. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Amy. Call me whenever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow, right? Oh, I guess. Yes. I guess we have to vote to accept it, yeah. Mr. Bernard, do we have to vote? I noticed uh, we're supposed to vote to accept Owen's Eagle Project. No, I don't think we're, we're there yet with the gift because he, okay. um, he may have some excess funds, too. Okay. I think we, I think we and I talked about Okay, so we'll wait to, together. Right. Yeah, okay. if you don't mind. All right. Next, I think we have our, our third and final uh, guest of the night. We'll bring up uh, Mr. Wayne Hardacre, Director of Buildings and Grounds and Everything That Moves at the School and uh, the School System. Do you have a presentation? No? Do you mind, Wayne? No. And Wayne, we love these because Wayne always brings a toy. 
Some to some years the toys are better than toys. others, yes. but sure. thank you. It's Hopefully nice to be here. Thank you for see the again, invitation. Wayne. My annual event. Yep. I have to get dressed up. <laughs> Mr. I told Mr. Bernard to keep it under an hour, and I said I would. So uh, <laughs> that's appreciated. So what I brought this year, I brought a light switch. You know, things are getting technical when you open up the package, and it says, for tech support, call this 800 number. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a light switch. It's a light switch. Look at that wall over there. You see the, uh, the two switches with the green lights? Yeah. This is one of them. And what this, what this entails is you can plug it in. You can open up one of those. You see one of these cables. And it Does it go into the network, basically? It does. This, this would go to a laptop. You would program it to operate. Wow. Wow, that's pretty cool. It says the tech support. <laughs> tech support, the lights. Yeah. 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 I think I'll have to get the microphone. Jerry could never use one of these. <laughs> Jerry? Jerry, you could never turn one I of these. I have used a light It switch. says on off. Oh, I don't right. know if you would use it. Handle it. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, I did, I checked the uh, room on my computer, right here, my little, on my uh, iPhone. And there's a comfort setting between 68 and 70. And the room is exactly at 69 degrees. That's pretty good. And if I needed to change something, if Mr. Bernard or Mr. Connolly said it was too hot or too cold, they probably wouldn't do that, but they might. Excuse I could change it. <laughs> right on your phone? And I could change it from home if, if I get it. Sometimes I have. If Allison Kane might call me about an issue in the PAC and it's too hot or too cold, I can make a change and I don't have to be here, you know, but it, it is pretty cool. So. Wow. So I'll review my report. Put my glasses on. Okay. On. So we currently have 18 full-time employees, um, 15 custodians. This school has eight custodians, three during the day, five at night. Three custodians at the bachelor, two at the hood, two at the little. Um, in the last six months, we've hired four new people. The last gentleman, Mr. Nick Aiello, started last Tuesday. Um, folks have left on their own accord, retired or whatever, and we've replaced them with, I guess, some new blood, I guess, so it's pretty cool, so. <clears throat> their names are Evan D'Amato, James Fafard, Joseph Howard, and Nicholas Aiello. They're all stationed here. Um, so we try to gauge the amount of cleaning to these employees we have. So the, the average rule of thumb is 28 to 30, 28,000 to 32,000 square feet for full-time employee per shift. The larger number is 92,000 approximately for, for maintenance standards. Um, we're, we fine tune things, we're pretty close to that. We, we've moved people around, we've analyzed areas. But in middle school and high school, we're here. This school added 100,000 square feet to the overall cleaning of the campus. Um, we're, we're, we're tight for people. I, I always say that, but uh, um, so. I mean, what's the what's the total square footage of all the buildings? And that do you know? About 450. So there's no way we have one FTE maintenance worker per 92,000 square we, feet. We don't. But what we've done is we've hired several contractors to help us True. as needed. True. True. Um, but we do expect a lot from our employees. Right. We, we, we're, we work them hard. You know, we work, and any skill you might have, we'll tap into it. Um, all kinds of skills that these people have. And I just promote, if you, if you feel you can do something, I'll promote it, try it, we'll buy you equipment if you can do it. And it's worked pretty well for us, so. So what I'm looking for um, is an additional custodian, additional grounds person, and an assistant for me, because of all of the technical needs of this department that pretty much are on my shoulders. Um, I've been here 18 years and I've had zero sick days, but if I go down, it, it could be a challenge. <laughs> it could be a challenge. So all, of, all, the, all the equipment we have now is, is pretty much computer-based. The latest one we have, we figured out, is the lighting, which is, that's taken so long to get there. This school now is completing four years. The middle school is completing three years. So we have, we have automated logic which controls all the heating ventilating systems throughout. To a lesser degree, the bachelor. To a lesser degree, the hood and the little. But they're all automated logic. And if you recall, some of those meetings we had, 
back when we were building the place, we wanted to go proprietary automated logic. We put up a real, I'll call it battle, because it and, it, and it's worked to our benefit. It really has. Okay. Because one system, I can bring up the whole system on my screen, tap, tap on a school, I can check the bachelor. I can check the boilers at the hood, the boilers at the little. It's, it is pretty cool. So the lighting was another challenge. Everything is computer based. And we had to get a company from Atlanta, this acuity lighting company. We have a service agreement with them. We have a service agreement with Automated Logic, Acuity Lighting, and BCM Controls, which manages all of our security systems. So fobs, cameras, and, and it's, it's all state of the art. And the, the key to me is keeping up with the technology, which is a, is a daily demand for me, so. Uh, we've been very successful with our Maya Rewards program. Uh, we've, two grants have received over $25,000 through Maya grants, and I'll list off some of the things we have had grants for. Asbestos safety awareness training, roof inspection program, infrared heat loss camera, septic system preventive maintenance program, air quality testing, and combustible, combustible gas equipment. Um, we've also replaced some of our fleet. We keep it, we have, um, Three 7D vans are run every day. We have one spare. We have a food service van and two vehicles the grounds equipment uses for plowing and any number of things. And we, we, we keep, with Mike Connie's help, we've, we, we keep it keep it rolling and, uh, so, and, and keep them, everything's by inspections, they all run well, so. Little, I'll go by school. Little, the little school, <clears throat> two years ago we did a, uh, through the Mass School Building Authorities, accelerated repair program. We put an SBS roofing system on three quarters of the school and it's uh, a 20 year warranty. It's, 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 it, it, really is, it really is, you know, whatever leaking over there, it's all state of the art, much more insulation and it, and it really has performed well. Another thing we're, I'm, I'm proud of, we're proud of is the, uh, we have three lock and wire boilers over there and they're in the 60 year operation extremely efficient, 96% efficient. Wow. Um, they've performed exceedingly well. I can fine tune those, so sometimes Mrs. Molly might complain it's too cold in a room. And I, you know, I can just be joking there about that, but I can, I, but I can fine tune. It really, they really work well. <clears throat> the school is more evenly heated and we're saving lots of energy over there. Uh, another project we're still working on is to remove all the asbestos floor tile in that school. Now that school, was built in the 60s, and most of the floor tile in there was asbestos floor tile. And there still is some asbestos floor tile there. Now, having asbestos floor tile, it can be a bit of a challenge, but when we, when we take care of it properly, and we do, it's, it's maintained properly, it's always waxed well, it's never an issue. We have, we have inspections by an asbestos uh, hygien hygienist company, and it's, it's never an issue for us. We take really good care of it. But the goal is 100% safe, right? There's no 100% safe. But the goal is to remove it. Now this school, there's none in this school. Whatever was in the bachelor, that's all gone. Most of it's gone from the hood, and there's, there's some floor tile to, at the little. So it's it's safe, but the goal is to remove it. And it, it's 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 been there a long time, and it's in in good shape. But that's our goal. Uh, we want to replace the school's bell system, and maybe this Saturday we'll be doing that. I think we can replace the school's bell system. And maybe this summer we're going to try to repave most of the parking lots. Another proposal is to replace the gym floor. With a, since, um, that's pretty well worn out at the little, with a floor similar to the hood and the, and the, uh, batch, and the, and the bachelor. It's with a synthetic floor. The hood school, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. I'll interrupt me if you have any questions or comments or... Um, so the automate, we have automated logic installed at the hood school, which controls the boilers in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the heating drives. And here again, I can, I can fine tune those also. Depending on the time of year, and I can change the temperature of the water from home. If, you know, if, if say it's a weekend and we want to shut the boilers down, if it's going to be 55 <coughs> and up, I can actually shut them off. If there's no one in the school, or if there's no activities going on to, to keep it, to save some energy, so. Um, we're considering replacing the gym lights with high efficiency LED fixtures. And we had to rebalance the heating controls in the lower wing 
Um, we had an old Honeywell control system, which was installed in 1999, when the day I came into the school, we had it, we were rebuilding that school. And we had a company, we found a company to help us rebalance the heating system in, in that wing, so. The bachelor's school were really proud, go ahead. I, I have one question. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about the modular units at whatever, what, what building still have modular units and what is the sure. state of Repair. The hood has four classrooms that are modulars were put in 2003. The little has like a double modular was put in around the same time. Um, we take really good care of them. And do they, de do they deteriorate over time? I guess a life expectancy generally would be 10 or 15 years. We take exceptional care of them. They're all gas fired, individually heated and cooled. Um, the staff likes them. We take really good care of them. Um, is there a time down the road we'll, we'll probably say goodbye? We may. We had, at one point, we had 22 cl classrooms that were modulars. 22. We had eight at the high school. We had 10 here. They served us well, and they're gone. But um, the hood mods have served us well, and they're still in good shape, so. Okay. I think we have, we have yeah, discussed, we, we have discussed, um, taking them down because the um, maintenance costs are going to only increase on those as, as we move forward. Um, but as long as we can get useful life out of them and the costs aren't prohibitive, I, th I think yeah, that we, we, we did a little bit of money recently. We did, we, we did have a company, brought an engineering company in to do an analysis. Yeah. yeah. They, now, they analyzed the forest and right. took one underneath, looked, took pictures and some things we have done we need to do. Mm -hmm. They always pass muster. Yeah. Every time we have an inspection by the building department, the fire department, check, check, check. So <coughs> we should probably keep the one up a little until we build a new little school. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can keep it two years, right? The bachelor is in its twelfth year of operation, and it. I guess the thing that I'm proud of over there, the building was 100% commissioned. Now back bef back then in 0405, commissioning wasn't primary, and. I have a little background in building some schools in Wakefield when I worked there, and I said, we probably should commission this school, and we did. We commissioned 100%. We spent the money. That school has run like a top, and I check that every day in my computer. And it could be a warm room, a cold room, but it, it really, 100% commissioning to me was a key to success there, and it, it has proven itself over time, several times over. Um, on Peabody Street was the old original entrance, goes back to 1919, 1920. Um, the landing had become deteriorated, the front facade was becoming deteriorated, and we got them both repaired. We fixed the landing and we fixed the whole facade with fiberglass columns. You take a look at it if you get a it chance. It looks good too. It they looks come, good. Come out really good nice. They went to the historic commission and they approved everything, so come out nice. So. <clears throat> High school. I've said a lot about it, but 270,000 square feet. Um, this is in year four, the middle school's in year three. Um, the boilers run like a top. The children's run like a top. We have heating, we have uh, energy management systems on all this, but this is high, by far the most sophisticated. Like I, I, can, I can look at this room right here and do any number of things that I need to do to keep people comfortable, or shut it off, you know, or shut it down, so. It is pretty cool. Um, I guess this is called a high-performance LED gold school, which is pretty cool. Um, we have displacement ventilation. What that means is that all the equipment, and say you go into a classroom, we might go to a bachelor hood a little, you see a wall unit, which is a unit ventilator. Here, they don't have, we don't have any. You go into class, you see a big diffuser, maybe two big diffusers on the wall. It's high volume, low flow. There's nothing, no, it's quiet. There's no sound coming there. There's no motors running. Everything's up on the roof. Um, there's 19 rooftop units here. Um, there's 1,000 air filters up there, approximately 1,000 air filters, and probably there's access, there's probably 400 access doors on all those 19 units. So all of the work we do is up there, not in the classroom, um, and we have a company to help us do that. Uh, it's really state of the art, so. The heating and ventilating system, we're in, we're in version 6.0. We, we continue to go to school to keep us up to date with it because it changes so rapidly. <clears throat> so our service agreements are with Automated Logic, 
acuity lighting in BCM controls. It's HVAC, lighting, and security. We have uh, agreements with companies. We team up with the RMLD for demand shedding. Every once in a while, I may get a call in the summertime. It's going to be really hot from 5 to 6. If I can shut something off, I can, if I can shut a chiller off, I can do it. Save some energy. So the, 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 it cuts the demand, so we can save some energy. So. so that's pretty much it. I guess the key, the last, my last four words on this, and I've said this since I walked in the door, and it's, it's still critical for me, it's clean, safe, warm, and dry. You know, I, I may be like a broken record. Maybe you don't know what a record is anymore, but <laughs> clean, safe, warm, and dry. If I can do that every day, and I do, without fail, hopefully, 365 days a year, any season, it's, those are my big four. You know, my, you know, and I, yeah, you Wayne know, we know, yeah, Wayne, we know, clean, safe, warm, and dry. But it, and they're all different needs. The clean part, you want to know clean part. The safe part, that's critical. The warm part, I mentioned, and, and the dry part. So that, to me, th those are the keys to this, to my job anyway. And it's, you know, and I still, this, this, thanks to Mike and John, it's just a lot of fun to work here. So questions, comments? Any questions or comments, sir, for <coughs> Wayne? Uh, just Jerry. Again, Wayne, it's been a real challenge with the new facility, the middle school, high school. I know how much it's, uh, how hard you've worked it kind of master it, um, but uh, again, I say this every year, you and your crew do a tremendous job at all the schools. I think we tend sometimes to focus on the middle school, high school, but I make sure that before school starts, I get out and yeah. walk with the yeah. batch elder in yeah. the hood and the little, and uh, tr tremendous job. I mean, I just say to the staff, they do welcome the visits. They, no matter where you go, they, they yeah, know who you they are. Do. They engage you. Welcome so the visits. walk in, they're more than happy to talk to you and explain things to you. So We want those floors to shine no matter where they are and yeah. first impressions and no, I think I think we get a lot of compliments on the way our schools <laughs> look in, inside yeah. and out. I know it's a challenge. I'm glad I'm glad uh, Mr. Bernard has you know uh, taken it upon himself to um, you know bring in some outside contractors for some of the grounds work because it's a lot of work and especially with this facility now. So yeah. So I have the good work. Thank you. I have a question related to lighting and and maybe Michael can chime in here. I know we just when when this building was built we just missed the cutoff where they started requiring all new. Um, projects to have LED lighting and we were approved before that so I, I'm glad to see um, that we're going to upgrade the lighting here but you know to me if we could and, and I know there's a cost involved here because sometimes it's more than just lights it's also fixtures etc that we have to change but you know from everything I've seen the, the savings from LED lighting can be extremely large um, we've, we've on, already started outside, some of the outside lights have been replaced right from incandescent to LED. Just last week. We just started that. Oh, excellent. Last, yep. week. last yeah. week. But I guess one of the questions is, what about the funding for that? I mean, is that, Michael, is that something that we're going to have to allocate funds for? Or? So we've started trying to, um, as the funds are available, mm -hmm. as we approach the end of the, the fiscal year, if, we, if we're able to save through other areas in Wayne's budget, to invest some of that, that funding and kind of phasing in the, 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 the purchasing of LED light fixtures, um, starting in maybe the, the main common areas, some, some outside areas as well. I know I saw the gyms, away. like the gyms at the other schools too, if we could do that. Yeah, so that, that the elementary schools right now, that's part of our large capital plan. So okay. we have some, some funds that have allocated you know, into the future starting fiscal you know, 20, I believe, right. um, to focus on the elementary schools, but here, we're starting to build a stock of, of LED light fixtures through some identified funding when, when um, you know, those savings are, are realized throughout the fiscal year so we can start that process. And we, Just a quick we made a small investment at the end of last year. Quick so aside. We do have some available. A parent, I think the parent from the, at the bachelor mentioned, connected with me, works for Standard Electric, or works for Standard Electric Company, and said there's a program through Mass Save, you can buy these complex fluorescent, which you'll see some of the smaller ones. They're like a dollar a piece. We bought 500 of them. And so it, we, we have these, these small, which you'll see in bathrooms and some of the, other, some of the smaller areas. We started replacing those with LEDs. It's, it, it, it's a long process. But like what, in, in here, do we just take these bulbs out? Is some of these are LEDs already, it looks like. Or, 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 these, these are not LEDs. They're not. No. So do we so just the take them out? The challenge for me now is how do I get up there? What do you mean? That should be easy. No, I'm okay. I know I can fly, but. <laughs> So but these would be LED, these would be LED. But in here, it's just taking the bulb out and screwing an LED pretty bulb much, in. Pretty right? much, they, no, they pop, they pop in. Most and of the interior, so yeah. yeah. So it's the savings is 
is better if we kind of start doing it on our own. You know, right. this mm. performance contracting and, and that we've looked at with Johnson Controls in the past and done assessment and they've come in and identified, you know, some savings and particularly this building would be significant through LED light fixtures. Um, but if you get if you enter into a performance contract, you don't realize those savings until maybe after ten years or so. Yeah, I think if right. we do it on a gradual basis. So that's the idea is to start yeah. phasing it in as yeah. things start to, to burn out and yeah. so forth. I, I just I don't have a lot of opportunities to publicly thank Wayne and his staff for the work that they do and I, I appreciate Mr. Venezia's comments too about the condition of our schools um, you know I think we we can all say that we are proud of of their appearance uh, daily and, and I think we do subscribe to the, the clean uh, warm safe and dry mantra you know it is it is something that we've added cooling to that lately too haven't right. we Wayne I believe and for, for this cool. building but I, I also want to acknowledge Michael's involvement uh, Michael has has um, you know, dedicated a significant amount of time, particularly um, working with Wayne in his department, particularly since the opening of this of this building. And I don't think his efforts, um, n number one, should go unnoticed. And I and I want to acknowledge that. Um, you know, I think he and Wayne have have very regular contact um, and work very well together to bring about you know kind of the best school uh, buildings that we can on a daily basis for students and staff. So Wayne, thank you to you, Michael and Wayne. Please uh, please convey my appreciation to your staff and beyond what what we might do when we see them personally, okay? Thank you. I just want to add, uh, you know, uh, I know we have a challenge with our upcoming budget, but um, I, I think um, this facilities engineer, I mean, I think all three positions are critical. I think the facilities engineer position is extremely critical, and, and I think we need to find a way. Uh, I know it's probably not going to be included in the recommended budget, but I think we need to find a way to include that position next year. So I'm just asking the committee and, the administration to if we can maybe figure out a way to do that I, which I mean which position did you facilities say? engineer because you know I mean so much here. there is so much technology in this school now mm -hmm. um, and the other schools if you ever get a chance come down to my office and I, I, I had the facilities director from Wilmington over to you know kind of compare our notes here but to show what we have and what we need to do to keep it operational it's 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 it's, it's time it is time consuming it's yep. time consuming Anything else for Wayne? Thanks again, Wayne. Thanks very much, Wayne. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank hey, you very much. You Thanks really have never taken a single sick day? No. I, know, I was wondering that, too. Zero That's sick impressive. impressive. That's impressive. No question. <laughs> I do take a vacation. He does take time off. <laughs> just, so we're, just so we're clear. <laughs> no sick days. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks you. So okay, so, um, John, before we get into um, continued business, I think we do have a couple of parents here who might be interested in the, in the uh, fee discussion. So. Sure. Can we jump to that? Absolutely. So you can get out of here. You don't have to listen to us to go over policies and all this other stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so we'll move to this item. This is um, we've actually had a discussion with this at uh, on this at school committee. We've discussed it in depth at athletic subcommittee. Um, I I had a hardened stance at one point, but I think I've I've softened my stance on this a little bit. I don't know what the answer is. Um, we do have a policy um, related to fees for co-op teams, um, but I think it's fair to say that in at least one case, this has kind of created a, a hardship. And, and I give, uh, and I'm referring mainly to girl, I'm referring to girls hockey. And I give credit to the parents um, who formed a boosters club, and I think they've done a lot in this season to raise money. And I was actually happy to donate to help get the, the group started. But um, I do think we have to look at this. Um, Michael, what is the, what is the um, fee that hockey, the girls, are paying right now? So based on the, the current structure, um, the way the policy was written and drafted a little over two years ago, um, they would pay um, a maximum of the North Reading family cap. So they would pay no more than $1,300 per athlete. Right. Um, obviously, if there are you know, multiple you know, siblings or a multi-sport athlete, that, that fee for the co-op ice hockey program may be less than maybe 900 or, um, or less, depending on the, that situation. <coughs> PBD is charging us. How much is so she? So PBD's have? fee varies each year um, based on their actual cost. So they have a process where they, they go through and they identify their own costs. Um, and then it's you know based on the participation of the of the team, it's both you know Linfield, PBD, and North Reading. Then they assess that that cost. It's been as high uh, you know a few years ago that that cost was 
um, about $1,500 per athlete that they would then assess the, the participating districts, Linfield and North Reading. Um, most recently, last year, it was twenty-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-three dollars. I think was that for the cost, program total cost. Oh, right, for the program, right. Eight, so they're looking at players. that and dividing by about twenty-one or twenty-two students. Yeah, by twenty-two players. So this year, so it comes out the current fee was about one thousand three hundred sixty-three dollars per student. Last year it was a little bit more than that, one thousand three seventy-two. Um, so that is the cost that's um, assessed. Um, but that's e that's that, that's the cost over for everybody. Right. Over every, but they, the but other towns are subsidizing, is subsidizing and and and, right. and the one thing I would add is, given that we've provided them with a freshman who was the league MVP, I think that all our girls should well, play for sophomore, free. Sophomore. I mean, the two best players. A sophomore, right? I mean, I think best, all our the girls best should. Best players on that team. Exactly. Up I think that's all nice. our girls should play for free. What do you think? Free? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> we'll talk to Peavy. I'll give him a call. All right. <laughs> but why are you yeah, playing so way the heck down in there? Oh. Jeez. So, uh, I, 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 mean, I can provide a little bit of financial data on what the impact has been. So, um, I went back and I looked at the last two years when the co-op has been in existence in this current fee structure we've kind of followed based on this policy that exists currently. So, in 2016-17, we had six students participating. Um, two of those students paid the $1,300 fee. Three of those students paid 900, and one student paid 400. So we collected $5,700, and we were assessed a total cost from PBD of 8,232. So that the difference that the district picked up um, or subsidized was $2,532. Uh, that was last last school year. The second year of this policy that was been in existence. Um, we have seven students participating. My records I pulled to, um, showed four students paid the maximum, the $1,300 family cap. Uh, two students paid 900, and then one student was not assessed a fee because it, it must, I think it's a sibling and uh, they'd already reached the family cap. So mm -hmm. we collected $7,000 and we were charged from Peabody $9,543 and change, so the difference was about $2,543 that the district uh, you know, picked up or subsidized that, that, that difference. So that's this year we have seven players this year? Correct. Okay. So, so it's about, it's about $2,500 that, I guess. But if, if we were to go with um, charging a regular. <coughs> yeah, uh, so I looked, I looked at that as okay. well. So I, I looked at the data. If we were to charge the, the regular fee, so it would be the, the 400, 200, 200 policy mm -hmm. um, that's assessed for all, all of other sports. Um, last year, it would have been two students would have paid 400, four students would have paid 200, we would have collected $1,600. Um, so the subsidy um, that the district would have paid last year would have been $6,632. That's a difference of about 4100 between what happened last year and what would have happened under the, mm -hmm. under the, 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 the fees, the change in the fee structure. Michael, can you say that again, a difference of 4000 $4,100. Thank you. This year, it's very similar. Both years are similar. Um, we would have had four students, I believe, that would have paid the $400. And we would have had two students that would have paid $200. I think, I think one student would have reached the family cap or thereabouts. So we would have collected about $2,000. Again, we were assessed the $9,543. So um, the subsidy would have been $7,543, a difference of about $5,000. <coughs> OK. so. It's a lot. <coughs> I'm looking for a happy medium mm -hmm. here. I, I, I don't think we can charge the 400. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Do you have the information? I, I, I think we know how Linfield does it, right? Yeah, so I spoke to Linfield. They sort of split the difference um, between, you know, essentially, I think what they do is, um, I'm just going to look at the email quickly. So essentially, um, they decided what they're, so whatever they're charged from Peabody, uh, whether it be that they're the difference, let's say it's around $7,000, they, they share that equally between the participating students and the <coughs> district. So they would cover, you know, 3,500, and then the, they would ask the divide parents to cover up. the remaining. And if that, so they that, divide that in half. They divide that in half. So and I think it worked out to around $700 or to $800 that they assessed to each 
each student participating. If that makes sense. See, the problem with this is it's not a co-op problem. It's a hockey problem. That's right. the issue. Other co-op sports like gymnastics, uh, like ski, whatever they might be wrestling, the fees are going to cover it because you don't have the expense that you have associated with hockey. Right. So this is, this is. Uh, well, it's, it, is, it is a co-op unique, problem though because if we had a girls' hockey program here, we'd be charging them four hundred dollars. Well, right? And we'd be charging them four hundred dollars, and the program would cost. No, no, no. I know. I know that, but I'm saying it is a co-op issue because if it was a girls' hockey program, we'd be charging yeah. them four hundred max. I'm looking for, so I came into this, I'll be 100% honest, I said, um, you know, it's, it's great that we're offering this program, but it's a co-op program and the parents have to pay the fee, okay? Julie kicked me enough times under the table that then I said I was willing to listen. Uh, I think we need to find a happy medium. I, I, think, um, I think having four students paying $1,300, that's what you said, right? Mm -hmm. This, Correct. I mean, I just think that that's you know, that covers them for a whole year for every other sport too, though, right? If they were that's to do a cap. spring sport, or they, they would, would never, they would, it would never exceed the cap. Correct. It would right. never exceed the cap. <clears throat> I, the I, I kind of like um, the Linfield way of doing it. Um, if we did it, so how much? If if we if we did it the Linfield way, so Peabody's charging us this year ninety five hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. That put forty seven fifty. For the school district and forty-seven fifty for seven players. Yeah, so I'm looking at what Linfield did. I have a break. So they they actually assessed their user fee first. So they asked that um, each student would pay maybe the four hundred dollar user fee. Right. Okay. And then they would collect that, and then that would come off um, the difference, and then they would they split the remaining cost equally. But then we have, so we had. So they're splitting the cost above and beyond the user fee. Correct. So what happened? So we had two students this year um, who paid. How'd you break that down again? There were some. So we had four that paid thirteen hundred. Mm -hmm. Four thirteen yeah. or two nine hundred and one no fee. Correct. So. So I can run through the Linfield scenarios. But but what? So what would happen? So the one paid no fee because the family's already reached. Yeah, there's. They didn't believe there's two nope. siblings on the team. Right. So, they so the what would happen to that family if we changed our? If we if we went to the Linfield system, so would they still pay the no fee? Linfield system. That's this one. They still would pay no fee, right? Only if you kept the cap. If you observe the cap, they would. Kept the cap right. Pot in. So the Linfield system. <laughs> if we assessed our fee, um, which I guess is similar to Linfield of four hundred dollars, um, I guess you would go you know the seven times the four hundred, right first. And well, what if they're only paying two hundred? Right, it could be a two second. Right. It could be a changes, I would sport. think, to what other sports they're doing. So I guess what we, I guess how we would do is we would we would have collected two thousand dollars. So you would take the nine thousand five forty three minus the two thousand, get seven thousand five forty three, and then split that. Um, so it would be seven seven thousand five forty three divided by two. Divided by two divided by seven. And then take and then divide that by seven. Right. It would have assessed an additional five hundred thirty-eight dollars. Yeah. But how do you deal with someone who's met the family cap already? Well, then that's, you have to pay the. That's their cap. <laughs> they're, 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 they're done. So then I that we're so we're yeah. dividing it by five, not seven. Right. Yeah. That's right. Well, and I think then other people are picking up. I don't. What would have happened in this situation is the families that paid thirteen hundred would be paying four hundred plus the five thirty-eight. So they'd be paying like nine thirty-eight instead of thirteen hundred. Thirteen hundred. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you would. Districts do. that would, the families that paid. 900 would be paying 200 <laughs> plus the 538 they'd be paying like 738. The does that other it does. Yeah. The other option you could have though too is the district just subsidizes more than the 50% and the families rather than dividing it by the 5 you still divide it by the 7. Or you could just do it the way we do everything else and have them pay their user fee. Yeah, and then we just occur that's, the district that's, subsidizes. That's yeah. Like yeah. like Peabody does, right? Like Peabody does <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. And like they, for Peabody other pays their user fee. Like the they do, but and PD is collecting the revenue from us, though. That's how they make up. Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Just, just identify yourself, and you can. Oh, no, that's all right. We need yeah. want to bring a microphone so they can hear you on. Come on, you have. We want to hear you on cable TV. Just, just tell us who you are and your address and. Hi. All, all that. Kind of hi, I'm Chris Thibodeau. Mel. Oh, hi, Chris. How are you? <laughs> um, I forget what I was going to say now. No, you were saying Peabody. Peabody's fee. Oh, so Peabody, Peabody pays one, pays one fifty per player. Right. Mm -hmm. So, is the user fee for them? Yeah. So, um, Linfield is 600. half. It's six hundred. Yeah. 
So Linfield matches them. They'll pay half and then the family pays half. Yeah. If they play two sports, they do their, I forget what the amount is for the first sport, but then they just pay the additional to get to 600. So some That's parents, a lot less. some parents whose children played a fall, fall sport in a winter just paid $600. Okay. Well, PB's doing what we do. They're embedding right. the cost right. in their overall. Right. If this was if this was a North Reading girls hockey team, that's what we would so do. so bad. Well, if we had enough players. <laughs> I know. Um, a couple of years. There's 13. I know. There's a lot of kids. I, there's a lot of girls playing, and uh, the mites and the yeah. all that all those age groups now. Yeah. So, um, but I, I think we need to. Um, I think we need to. I don't know if we need to change this policy or have a separate policy for hockey. Well, go ahead, Julie. You know so I'm just wondering what the athletic subcommittee has discussed about this. I wasn't at the last meeting, so we, no. we did talk about it, and what we did was we basically came up with these numbers. You know, we, we did an assessment the of the cost. Thing? I don't think we took a vote. On which which we numbers? I think you just numbers? asked. No, no, the numbers we just gave you. The, right. The overall cost this year the was 29.993. There were 22 right. players. It was assessed uh, per student, and and that's the the fallacy here is that every kid is being assessed the same amount, it just depends on who's paying for it. Right. In the case of Peabody, Peabody's paying all but the 150. In the case of Linfield, right. all they're but paying six all but 700. Six, yeah. 700. Yeah. And then with us, we're basically going above and beyond whatever it is above and beyond the, uh, right. the user fee. So we talked about the numbers, we talked yeah. about what the cost would be. Right now, this year, if we were going to subsidize the entire program and just charge these kids the regular user fee, either two or $400, depending on what sport they're playing, it would have cost us $7,500 from our budget. Right. So 5,000 more. Which, so. which gives you some idea um, of, of what the hockey program costs. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the other hockey, the boys' pro hockey program is, is basically embedded in the, in the overall budget, which we pay for through the appropriation and through the revolving account in some respects, right. depending right. on what we're paying for. Yeah. So let me, let me tell you how far I've come on this, except it, it makes me nervous if we get larger numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think maybe the fairest thing to do is to charge the fees we charge our other athletes mm -hmm. um, to charge them. Yeah. No but if you, if you have 10, 12 players, then you're starting getting up there 10 or $12,000. And then well, we're going to have an issue with budget. But once, you, but once you, you get, a hockey get, team, right? But once, yeah, once you get well, no, you to have a certain to have, point. You have to have at least 20 to form a hockey yeah. team. But once you get to a certain point, you have a $30,000 hockey team. team. Yeah. What's that? Once you get to a certain point, you have a $30,000 right. hockey Right. You need probably 15 so. players. Which we have players. a $30,000 right. hockey Correct. team right now. Right. Well, so if I can just add a couple of things. I mean, I think, to me, there are arguments on both sides, but it, it, we have said that you know, regardless of the sport, we want everybody to have the opportunity to play. And to me, it's about opportunity. And my worry is if there's a family that wants to play, only wants to play this one sport, and they can't afford it. You know, And, and the reality is we've had Olympians come from North Reading. We've had women at the highest college level play, some of them get full scholarships to go there, and it's an opportunity that's being, North Reading's that's being promoted. That's being promoted. college hockey. It is, it and is. so to, to make, to, yeah, yeah. and, the and I, I get that the, the financial need, or a financial concern, but the reality is, it's the same concern for the boys hockey team, and you know, to me, I would say, again, I'd, I'd, if there's a compromise to get it, I'm okay with that, but I would go all the way to say, it should be the same user fee. Here's the only difference, Scott, that when we decided to expand and to do a co-op team, yeah. there was based on a, a deal. This was the deal. And otherwise, maybe we wouldn't have done it. And we wouldn't have had a co-op hockey team if the cost was going to be you know, yeah. seven to $10,000 a year for us. Um, so we made a deal. Having said that, I agree, I think, with both Scott and Mel that may, the time may have come for us to just basically uh, go with the same fees as we do for everybody else. I mean, my, my, my concern financially is, uh, you know, I guess the question, and this would be more for the athletic director, um, is how many players, and, and when I say players, I mean players, who, I mean, we tried many years ago to start a girls hockey program. Not really. Well, we hit, but the, <laughs> the girls that showed up. They couldn't skate. Right. No, I mean, well, so we need, we need real, we need, you know, how many players is it? How many players do they have on the roster? Do you know? On uh, just the, us? No, no, no. How many players are on the, the whole team? team? The team. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. You can only dress twenty. So right. They have twenty. So I mean, I think you need to get, you know, that. Yeah, twenty-two. 
18 players interested before you can have a full program at North Reading, which I wouldn't oppose. I mean, obviously, I'd rather have a, a team that represents North Reading. We would too. Because um, they don't even put North Reading in their name. They I put know. Peabody Linfield. They will in a few years. We've actually changed, 13. You know, you, we, we changed the logo, but if you've seen the girls and they wear it. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's yeah. Not, not that many Peabody students. It's mostly Linfield, North yeah. Reading. Yeah. Well, North Reading has seven. Linfield has 12, I, think, I thought. A lot of players, right? Oh. From Linfield, actually has about seven. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Oh. so the North Red North Reading and, and Linfield are providing more players than the first two lines are North Reading. Right, yeah, I know. and they play the no. whole game. Yeah, so so I think, I, I mean, Michael, I, the the issue that I have is so this would come out of the um, revolving, revolving fund, account. right? Correct. Which we run pretty close to. It's it's pretty tight. We've worked hard right. to manage it, so yeah. we're not running it right down. Right now, we're at probably year. about what is it, seventeen thousand? We think we're going to end the year uh, with about seventeen thousand dollars in the revolving account. So this is a seven thousand seventy-five hundred dollars hit. Not nothing committed. Yeah. Is correct. So here's my recommendation. I think um, I don't know if this has to go back to the athletic subcommittee right now. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow, tomorrow where we can discuss it. I think the policy sub. I think that we ought to look at this policy. And maybe throw this policy out. And so you're talking for all co-ops. Yeah. For all co-ops. Yes. Like I said, I don't think it's a call problem. I think it's a hockey problem. And then if I think if it gets if, if it becomes an issue, where we look at it and we say, now we have we have a problem. We have you know 13 girls playing co-op hockey, and it's costing the district 15,000. We don't have those fundings. We have to. We'll have to figure yeah, out a way. Yeah. But but I, I think. Um, but uh, this, I mean, is, <coughs> this is the only sport that um, is charged these. The only fees. other thing I'd say is that traditionally, um, the boys team has been subsidized to a certain degree from their booster organization too. I mean, right. I don't know if as much yeah, as it used to be, right. but yes, they right. used to pay for a lot of the yeah, certainly yeah. the yeah. junior varsity expenses and even some varsity expenses. Right. That Correct. The boosters organization yeah, the ice team. would pay the for ice to ice reduce the, the overall reference. cost of the program. Yeah. So. Haven't they been backing? Trying yes. To they back are trying to back yeah, up, yes. Yeah. 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 A three-year three, three uh, phase Reduction. out, Correct. if you yeah. will. Yeah. Scott, do you have a... The, the, the only thing I would add is that, I mean, first of all, if 13 or 15 or 18 girls wanted to play, I, I would say that's a good thing, not a bad thing. And if, if it's a hockey problem, if that's the one sport that's more expensive, then maybe it's addressed as hockey is a little bit more expensive whether you're a boy or a girl, they, they or whether, whether, whether it's the booster, whether yeah. it's the boosters club paying for part of it, or there's some subsidy or, or something We've else. We've gone through but, this before. If yeah. you're going to do that, then you have to take every sport and break down cost right. versus uh, revenue, et cetera. Correct. And see but we're not doing that right now is the point. And so I don't, I don't think we'd ever I don't do that. I hope we would never do that because yeah. then you get sports that kids don't play anymore right. yeah. because hockey ends up costing right. $1,100. Like Hamilton Wenham has a hockey team now, a boys hockey team. They didn't have one for a number of years because they changed. They, they started assessing fees by sport, yeah. right. and hockey was like twelve hundred dollars. And if you're, if you're a hockey parent, when you get thirteen hundred dollars. It's a bargain. <laughs> yeah. But I, so so my recommendation is we can discuss it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but that the um, policy subcommittee, I, I, I think we can just. I mean, the athletic fees and co-op team should be they will pay the just the procedure the North Reading fee. Yeah. The North Reading Procedurally, fee. that they'll bill us and we'll pay them based on the fees that we collect. Right. Okay, so thank you. And I will give credit, to, even though I, I ignored them and try to ignore them most of the time, but Julie and Scott were the uh, drivers on this. I did sneak it back in the agenda when you were sick and I was chairing. Oh, did you? Yeah, I did. Thanks. <laughs> See, I'm away for six weeks and look what happens. <laughs> Jerry. The cat out of the bag. Tomorrow. Yeah, I think we should. So we'll discuss it tomorrow, and then um, Scott and Janine are on our athletic subcommittee. Well, that was I mean, policy, our subcommittee. policy subcommittee, and so they they will come back with a new policy, and um, you know if everything moves along, we will have this in place for next season. Great! Wow. <laughs> so how would we find out? You know the process. You've got to come every week now. I know. <laughs> We're not going to let you know anything from here. Actually, I, 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 I make it. Actually, it's not retroactive, by the way. Yes. Now. Yes. Well, no, no. It's not retroactive. It's not sorry, retroactive. but. <laughs> um, Mr. Bernard. I was just going to say, Mr. Thibodeau, you have my email address, right? Because we've called, just. I will. The two of us should keep in touch. How's that? Absolutely. Okay. This should not Thank take a long so time for us to get done. We should be able to have a revised policy within the next month or six weeks, and That's then. That's so great. Thank we, you so much, even for considering. 
Just to give you an idea of the time, so the athletic subcommittee would be tomorrow. Right. The policy subcommittee meets on March 16th. Now. Right. So, and I'll assume let's assume optimistically that something comes out of that meeting. The school committee then has to have it read at two of their meetings. So, so like Mr. Be, Webster said, it's probably a good it'd be early mid April. Eight weeks away. Yeah, early you know? mid April where we would get the policy to vote on. But well before the winter season next year. Right. And it'll be on That's the agenda. So, great. so just reach out to me for an update, okay? You know. The only issue is if we can keep these girls, you know, I know you want them to do well academically, but maybe if they could repeat a couple of years so we get six years out of them. It, would, I, it I really might have something to do with how well you do in the tournament, too. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just, I'm thinking of how I'm going to motivate my children tonight. you got no choice but to win. But again, I do want to give credit to Julie and Scott. They pushed us on this. And thank you, um, thank you very, very much. And I want to give it to Chris Thibodeau because she's the first North Reading parent to do what she did for our organization. And don't, and don't shut the boosters down now. Oh. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it, the, the, the other thing I would say is this came up because of the boosters yeah. club. Right. That's her. This all came up because you started the boosters club, which led to the discussion of how expensive question, it was. Why do we need the booster club? I love that. And, and why Scott, do they need I, to supplement I, so much? And I got to share with you when, when, we got, when my daughter got to high school, she's a freshman. And I found out how much high school hockey was going to be. I can't believe you never told me. <laughs> so, because she's been playing select hockey for years since she was little, and um, I went, "What? Are you cr why?" And I, no one could tell me why. And it was absolutely outrageous. It was. And people on the same team are paying hundred dollars. I know. Crazy. And then, you know, moms throughout the town with you know little girls were like, "What are you talking about? It's thirteen hundred dollars." boys pay 400 it just was a nightmare and I I just couldn't do it there was no way I was going to even be able to afford to pay for her in a snap like that I had no idea none it wasn't public knowledge it really wasn't so if you Nobody take knew how much girls hockey was try to keep it quiet though. yeah no <laughs> I know <laughs> you can take credit for this but you have to right give now. <laughs> give you you have to give Julie and Scott credit too absolutely all right thank you absolutely. so much well though but to be fair though I mean to change your opinion is also important exactly and, I mean J Jerry is worried about losing half his workers so he, he oh has, that's right <laughs> <laughs> he gets free work from right uh, exactly from girls yes, hockey so. players yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> that was his concern but you know Mel <laughs> and Janine were open to uh right thinking well Jean Janine doesn't said anything so maybe she's against it so again watch the agenda it should be I would guess we'll be on in April um, if you want to come when we bring the new policy up it probably be uh, April yeah time frame sure. I think so okay even that you're even discussing it is, oh is my just God. so huge we weren't expecting this, I'm so though. glad I came well if you only won one or two games this year we, no I'm only kidding. <laughs> I, I said that to them believe me yeah. I get that <laughs> so you got the reminder on Facebook today yeah. Oh, right. you're yours. <laughs> it was a convenient reminder. At 5.30 tonight. I started at 5.30. <laughs> oh, my God. You guys, thank, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. The boys are tied at three. The boys are tied? Are you three. kidding me? In the overtime? Or? No, it's the yeah, extra <laughs> Wow. I, thought I didn't hear it. I thought they'd want a winner. Okay. I'll bring this. Thank you again. So um, now let's get back to, I don't think we have an MSBA SSBC I do update, not, right? Chairman. Um, we have school committee policies, second reading tonight I missed the first reading oh boy I'm sure it was oh, thrilling we have uh, an English language learners policy which appears to be a new policy and then we have uh, a significantly altered policy which is related to advertising in school buildings or on school grounds <clears throat> so the English language learners I'm assuming is a requirement from the state and mass associations of school committees etc I mean, it was a suggestion by the M and one of the one of the policies in the MASC packet that we've gone through, and I think we've actually finished all 100 policies at this point. But okay. um, we that, so that was just one that we thought there's nothing similar in our current policies, and we wanted to enact something. So, does anybody have any questions or comments on this? Seems pretty straightforward. If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Yeah, so I move for to accept a second reading of. Policy IDDD under instructional program entitled English Language Learners. Second. Motion by Scott, second by Janine. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? One abstention. <laughs> Mr. Venezia, that's so 401. And the next policy we have is, uh, as I said, significantly revised. Four. Four. Jerry's, 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 Jerry's not here. in here right now. Hmm. So, yeah, because Jerry's. Jerry just went to the restroom. Oh, I <laughs> Uh, maybe he can vote when he comes back. I don't know. Um, 
The other the other item we have is it it previously was called adver advertising in the school. It's now called advertising in school buildings or on school grounds. I think part of this policy is related to um, some of the use we have of our fields by uh, youth groups, et cetera, and and our you know dancing schools, et cetera, yeah. using the uh, performing arts center. Um, so we're basically going to allow all advertising still has to be approved by the superintendent and by the school department. However, basically we're going to allow groups to advertise on days of events. So for example, mm -hmm. if there's a softball tournament and they're using the high school field and the little school, for the days of the softball tournament, they'll be allowed to have advertisements on the fence. Or if there's a dance recital, the dancing school can put a sign up. Correct. Outside the auditor outside the performing arts center. That's basically what this <coughs> says correct it does there's if you is there anything mind. else go ahead there was one change from the yeah. last time the school committee did a first reading so the, in the bolder red mm -hmm. in the third paragraph and all advertising shall also be in compliance with town bylaws yep that was added in after your first reading by the athletic subcommittee it was a recommended change uh, so I'm, that's I'm different in the so. bold. I'm fine with that um, I actually had had a comment on the last one that we needed to have something in here that said advertising would be compliant with town bylaws. Um, there so. you go. There you go. Anybody have an issue with that? No. Okay, so with, if that, I'll um, entertain a motion to approve revised uh, advertising in school buildings or on school grounds policy, KJ. It's a point of question. Is it... Uh Okay to do the second reading with those revi those revisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have to redo it again. Okay. Yes, as amended. Okay, so I so I move to accept for a second reading revised policy KJ under general public relations entitled advertising in school buildings or on school grounds. As amended. As amended. Well, I said amended before. I thought. No, as amended. As amended. Yes. Here we go. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thanks, policy subcommittee. Okay, school committee goals update. We're doing a great job. Next? No. <laughs> There's a lot of yellow. There's a lot of yellow on this. There's a lot of yellow. Um, I'll, I'm going to just start off here. I had a couple of questions. Um, under human resources, support the funding to hire one additional digital learning specialist did we not do that and do we not have the funding still for that well in a sense we have you might recall at the beginning of the year um, we hired michael callahan as a right. digital learning specialist but that was a that was not that was a retooling of the position that had been vacant vacated by a retirement of the business department at the high school we're looking to continue to go forward with that distant digital learning specialist but it doesn't necessarily preclude the need to hire That's the offset position. Okay. So, so we, still need to we, we still need to hire there's somebody. A, there's an additional position to be filled, correct. <clears throat> and then the other thing I had was um, on this page, and I'll let anybody, if anybody else is looking on this page, evaluate the need for additional staffing and services district-wide. We've kind of done that. We, especially, at least, um, I mean, we're gonna see that in the budget. Mm -hmm. You've, you've um, met with the administrative staff and team. And then Wayne has filled us in tonight on. So I think it's my, my thought on why I didn't highlight that one for you was that as part of the budget deliberation, okay. is where that would eventually be something that I think the committee has satisfied. But I didn't I didn't feel that it had to this to this point because you hadn't yet um, engaged in the preliminary budget review. Anybody else have anything on page one? Um, no. Well, I mean, I, I went through the whole thing and just to be, I think there was nine of them that I identified were probably going to come up as part of the budget. Mm -hmm. And so just to point out the things that are, are not in there, the pol on activities policy, A2, the policy of handheld devices, I don't know if that's something that we want to do or not. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's something you want. I think at some point we need a policy. I, I mean, I... I I just don't know how many, I mean, at some point when everybody has their one-to-one -one devices, then they'll all have computers and we won't have to do things on the, on the phones. They'll all have their, um, you know, their Chromebooks or whatever. But I, I just, um, I think we need some sort of policy. And I don't know if there are other school districts that have policies that we can look at. There really aren't. It's been very there, there really aren't. Fine. I have one that I'm going to bring to the policy subcommittee in March, you know, for, for them to look at. 
that Dan Downs has been working on, but. Well, there's bring your own device policy. Yeah, there are, right, there isn't a school committee, yeah. right, there are, there, there, there are, I say there are practices in our handbooks and such, but right. it's not, it's not codified in a, in a Aren't school. Aren't there some policy. schools where you go in and they'll have in the front of the classroom a box and you have to well, put your phone in there so and teacher yeah. is a teacher yeah. so it's not policy right it's not codified in a school committee policy yet like there are some teachers who do that sort of thing leave your <coughs> phones up in the front right. in a box or something and then some teachers don't i just ask that you, you continue to look at it yeah. i think it's worth i don't know if anybody else disagrees but i so, so I, 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 again, I just want to make sure whatever is, is going to be addressed. So that one seemed like one that needs to. And then on the first page, professional development. I don't know if we're going to address that at any point or not, but. That's related to the committee, right? Correct. Not. Right, that's your. I mean, that's tonight, I, over the last three months, I have had great professional development. And look at how far I've come in terms of listening to Scott and Jewel. <laughs> so let's I would schedule say. schedule something for June or late May. Oh. <laughs> that's personal development. Personal development, but it's whole also weekend, professional. Jerry. Huh? Whole weekend, Jerry. Yeah, whole yeah. weekend. Whole weekend in June. Yeah. Okay, a couple of people won't be here for that, but I'll schedule it for you. Yeah, but I, I do. I, I mean, I think that's always something that's that's on there. I mean, I think we, the best professional development you have, when you become a school committee member, is sitting through chart meetings or chart the course. Yeah. Or chart, but chart the course. But sitting. I've through, done professional development. Sitting through meetings, and by six months, you kind of. You know, well, some people it takes longer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. so I think we should. Con I mean, that's something that should always be on there. But I'm not. It's not always one that I think personally is critical. But if other people, well, I'm just saying, if we're going to have it on there, we should either do it or not put it on there or just highlight it and pretend we did it. Before Scott gets on to page two, anything else? Have anything with page? Anyone else? Anything with page one? I I just yeah. highlighted the um, additional staffing as well and. Yeah you know, kind of the attention to the well-being of the students and, you know, do we need more support staff, guidance counselors, adjustment counselors, that yep. sort of thing. I, I mean, I think ideally we'd be adding a lot more staff next year than we're going to see in the in the budget. And, and I'm sure you'd agree with that, too. That Absolutely. Wonderful to right. have more. Right. right. Yes. Okay. Anybody else on page, page one? Let's move to page two. I mean, I really don't have anything on page two. No. I think these are all budgetary yeah. things or in progress. Yeah. They're definitely in progress, and we'll be going over these as we yes. discuss <laughs> the budget. So page three, the educational program. I have a lot of X's here because I know what's going to happen. For example, under uh, number six, expand the foreign language curriculum at the middle school and the high school. I probably say there's slim and no chance of that happening and Slim just left town based on what I've seen in the budget, um, which is distressing to me, but I just don't know what we're gonna do. Um, we have not discussed, Julie brought this up earlier, um, expansion of the freshman advisory program for students at the high school and then adding computer science course offerings. I know we've, we're adding, we're expanding the robotics. The robotics academy, yeah. Um, but I think that these are all things that especially six and eight that we should, um, and maybe we'll have a discussion on those during the budget talks, I would guess, on both of those. Yeah. I mean, my, my only question was on eight, whether it was the budgetary issue or if there was a different issue. I think it's both, it's more, is it more budget, John? More budget, or it, it, budget and it, it staffing, is, right? There is a yeah. stipend, they are right. stipended position, yeah. so it is somewhat tied to the budget, yeah. not solely. Right, so I think that'll be, and, and I'm sure Julie will, Bring that up in our budget. We'll have a budget discussion at next meeting, correct, Michael? Correct. Yep. Preliminary presentation. And the last page, um, talk about, talk about, <laughs> now here's another I 180. Know where you're going. Here's another 180 for Mr. Webb. Where are you going on this one? Um, I no longer support the ex expanding <laughs> the use of social media as a communications tool. I, I, I just think it's impossible. That's, there's my take on it. I don't think I want, I don't want a school committee, this is just me personally, I don't want a school committee Facebook page. I, I think it would just be disastrous. So there you go. Well, I would make two points. <laughs> Number two. I knew Mr. Delaney would like that. Yeah. I would make two points. One was I was 
trying to propose Jerry being in charge of that. But, but he's yeah, he's yeah. going to start in June. I think I'm ahead of the yes. time. And Mel's <laughs> now. No, you're behind the time, and you're dragging me with you I back. Think a lot of the stuff is just bad. You know? but the, the only thing I would say is the social media can be broader than Facebook, and I do think is important, yeah. especially in times of budget, to get information out there. We do. Whether it's that's my point. I mean, just making sure that we get the information. I think the videos that Michael has done, educating people, just saying that there's going here's the information that you know Michael has put together and there's more coming yeah and then the use of multi multimedia with the budget yeah. and the app and things like that I mean so I, I think that's where I would go I don't think we need to get into arguments with community members on on Facebook yeah I'm half Maybe kidding we can use it for an informational tool and then have a policy that none of you can engage <laughs> I'm half kidding I'm half kidding on this by the way and I I do think you know I follow a lot of the accounts on on Twitter you know the athletic director John principals, Michael, Michael probably less so, but there's a lot of use of Twitter. Um, and, and, I, and I see, like, that's how I find out how the hockey team's doing, or the athletic teams, or, um, so I'm, I'm half kidding. I, I just, I've actually kind of taken look, a vacation from social media. You look healthier media, since so. you've been taking a vacation from that. I, I, I am much healthier. Um, I do think there continues to be an issue, though, that when you have and I, I'm sure Julie and Scott will agree with this, when you have parents making comments or posts that are either inaccurate, sometimes misguided, or I think there needs to be a monitoring of those posts so we can respond if necessary, I guess, is, is the way I would best put it. I don't know. You, so I, I think it's good that you know, we're available to at least see and hear what people are saying and, you know, perhaps think about some of those concerns, bring them to administration. But, you know, I think our role, and it, it's been more so recently that, you know, please contact, you know, our superintendent, right. the building principals for more information, share your concerns. Because, I mean, that's what we want people to be, to be I doing. I think all of this is a product of social media. Look what's happened over mm -hmm. the last 10 days. And look at tonight. Here's our first school committee meeting after all this that's happened. Right here in our own district and then in Florida, there was nobody here, not one. I mean, they're on, I, I, I'm not on social media, so they're, they're, my understanding is there's hundreds of people on there chatting and going back and forth with all of these ideas, and there's, there's nobody here. And I, and I do, I, I agree, and I do, I do think, and I, you know, I'll, give, I'll give credit to Scott, Julie, and myself on this one, is that we've used great restraint on this issue over the past two weeks and basically haven't got into arguments with people or and told people call the superintendent. Mm -hmm. be, that's really our only role to play here. And I, but I, I just do think we need to continue to monitor it and, and be on top of it. I, mean, I, th I think monitoring, I think giving general information about budgetary issues, you know, I've had a few parents reach out to me about various issues the last couple of weeks. I'll respond fully if somebody reaches out and asks a question. Um, beyond that, there's also a concern because if we have a Facebook post and Mel and Julie and I all comment on it, we've now violated open meeting law. Right, we're having a and meeting. And so, right. so we actually cannot, we have to actually be, be concerned about that as well because the whole purpose of the open meeting law is to not have discussions on forums like Facebook where you know, we get into it, and if we all comment on something that's before our committee, we've actually violate, violated the open meeting law. So we have to be cognizant of that as well. Right. We cannot be discussing. The three of us can't be discussing right. discussing an issue on a yeah. Facebook post because that then passes as a quorum. I'm as close to turning you all in. So. What for violating open meeting law? <laughs> Anybody have anything else on uh, the last page? Does that mean you actually did your ethics? Issue? I had something, and now I don't know what I did with the page. So. No, 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 the last page of the uh, the goals. I just wanted to. That was it, Mel. That was the fourth page. Yeah, um, we don't have to accept that or anything. Oh, the uh, district wide app. Are we making progress on that? Is that taking a back seat or what's Oh, no, God, no. No. I'm very. You, I, I'm anticipating as early as March I will have something to re roll out to you. Okay. So this is an app. Uh, Mr. Bernard has been working with. Making progress. Mr. Bernard has been working with some students and on, on developing a district wide mobile applications. He's been working with me. Students have working with Mr. Yes. Bernard. <laughs> so when do you say hopefully? I'm hoping that I'll have something to share with you as early as March. Okay. You know, give or take, but yeah. All right. Very exciting. 
So I just wrote down, Mr. Bernard will have a complete now. No, no I, I, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Okay, anything else on the goals? Jerry, this will be your last goals. Yes. Sir. This is what you're going out on, Jerry. This is it. Uh, and if, if nobody steps not, up, not, we can all write Jerry in, and he'll actually, have another no, three Jerry, years. Jerry, will, you'll, you'll get to evaluate yourselves. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This was only the mid-year update, okay. so you'll get to evaluate yourself. I'm sure he's going to give all fives. Scott, you have a question? Or? Oh, it is. Oh. No. Okay, next we have uh, uh, the notice from uh, Town Administrator Michael Gilberto regarding the deadline for town meeting warrant I articles. I we don't have any, correct? March 19th, John. Is the yeah, March 19th. Deadline. Not May 10th, right? No, it's March 19th. It's March 19th. It says right here, March 19th. Oh. Yeah, but it thing. says on the agenda of March 10th, May 10th. Oh. So it's March 19th. Is that a recommendation? Well, it says yeah. deadline. I'm sorry. I took the date for the recommendation of the article. I oh, apologize. Okay. It right. May 10th down the yeah. block. I don't think we have anything that. It is March 19th. There could no, be some items so. for the, uh, um, for capital, for capital, but we don't have any other <laughs> items, correct? I didn't think so. Okay. I, I, don't think, what, I don't think so either. Can I just ask, what is the Board of Selectmen trying to rename themselves as? The Select Board. The First select Board. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, was well, that true? The select board? The, the select <laughs> board, yes. No. The select Sorry. board. Because it's not select men. True. It's a select board. Hmm. Okay, next we have a, uh, a proclamation regarding North Reading night off. Would yes, like read, Mr. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. So the um, community impact team, K-12 action team, of which I serve as the chairman, um, and the members are uh, Rita Mullen, Lynn Clemens, Peter Majane, uh, Kathy O'Connell. Um, we have Gail DeMore now, a health teacher on the, uh, at the uh, middle school who's new to our committee, as well as Laurie Giacalone. She's new. Um, we are um, seeking Amber your, oh, and Ambro Driscoll. Oh my God, thank you. Yeah, who's, who's our lead on North Reading Night Off. Thank you, Scott. Um, we are asking that the, the school committee endorse um, the fourth annual North Reading Night Off to be held on Tuesday, March 13th. Um, the Board of Selectmen signed off on a similar proclamation at, at their last meeting, I believe, prior to tonight. And so this is just an opportunity for um, the community, families to come together without some of the complications of daily life, like scheduled meetings. Um, we are asking for a relaxation of homework requirements and such, and just uh, trying to promote um, some family time. So if the committee sees fit, as you have in the past, to sign the proclamation and commit to not uh, doing anything other than spending time with your family on uh, March 13th from 5 p.m. on. That would be appreciated by the K-12 action team. Do I really have to spend time with my son? No. So, well, you, you know, I said family, so I left it open for you. Poor Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he'll be out that night. No, I'm all kidding. So do we take a vote on this? I, I, if you wouldn't mind, and, and if you would, Mr. Webster, sign. Okay. The, so at this... The committee at votes in favor. This time I will... Take a motion to approve the North Reading Night Off Proclamation, so March 13th, 2018. So moved. Seconded. Motion by Scott, second by Janine. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. So you have, you have one I can sign, or should I sign this one? Or? If you don't mind, you can okay. sign that. All right, I'll give it to you afterwards. Mr. Chairman, before you go forward, yes. is it, there's an error on your report on the minutes. You should have three sets of minutes, but I, I typed them incorrectly. I'm sorry. You should have January 8th executive session and January 8th open session. There is no January 22nd executive session for okay. you tonight. There is a January 26th, uh, 22nd open session. So next we move to minutes, and I know nothing. I was not present. Right. Thank you. So uh, I'll ask someone else to <clears throat> make a motion or edit or whatever needs to be done with the minutes. For first for the January 8th, January 8th executive session. Can I make a motion to approve executive session minutes from January 8th, 2018? Executive second. or open? Executive. executive. We have, we have, executive. He just said we have January 8th executive. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll second. I, I was Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And one abstention? Make a motion to approve January 8th, 2018 open session minutes. We have a second? Second. Motion by Julie, second by Jerry for the January 8th open minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. One abstention. I'd like to make a motion to approve January 22nd, 2018 open session minutes. Second. Motion by Julie, second by Scott. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Oops, nope, sorry. What? Oh, wait that I, uh, <laughs> he voted. One abstention. Four in favor, one abstention. There, there, just to clarify, there wasn't an error. These, these meetings ended pretty early, didn't they? That's because you didn't have the brilliance of me to contend with. <laughs> Just let's say they ended up. I do, I do want to say I appreciate all of you keeping things going while I was uh, unable to attend for the last six weeks. So, Okay, next we have budget update. Mr. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the February budget update was included in your packet this evening. Um, it does summarize financial activity broken down by, through, by expenses and payroll activity through about the middle of February. Um, there's not a lot of new information to report from the January budget update. A lot of the same um, you know, drivers in fiscal 18 are still at play. On the expense side, uh, we have essentially at this point encumbered and are anticipating um, is spending the majority of our out of district tuition costs. Um, as I uh, discussed in January, we've had some additional costs arise to meet the needs of, of students in that area, but we had anticipated that during the fiscal year 2018 um, budget development process. That's why we had exceeded our, our prepayment amount at the end of fiscal 2017. Um, we had experienced at the beginning of January some, some challenging weather conditions and some s severe, you know, cold weather. So we did. We have incurred some additional, you know, snow removal, you know, costs in this area. But you know, at this point, I think we. Um, hopefully anticipate that these costs will remain kind of under control as we move uh, throughout the remainder of sort of the winter season. We'll, we hopefully we can get through the, the remaining weeks without a, a large event. Um, we're still monitoring utility expenses. We've encumbered all utility expenses at this point in, this, in, the, in the year. Uh, we did some incur some high you know, gas bills through the month of, through about the middle of, of February at this point. Um, but we'll just closely monitor these these costs. At this point, we don't anticipate there'll be a, a large um, amount of available funds in the utilities area between electricity and gas line items to, to repurpose, um, but we'll continue to, to watch those line items closely. Um, through the first half of the year, we did experience some um, additional expenses in the areas of, sort of maintenance needs like plumbing, HVAC, heating and cooling repairs, some, some boiler repairs, which we had we're able to dealt with, um, we're, so we're just kind of monitoring these, and we hopefully this won't be an issue the remaining um, you know, quarter and a half of the fiscal year. Um, our monthly update on the food service program, we closed out the month of January, unfortunately with a loss of a little over $2,400. Uh, we had hoped originally that we would earn a little over $800 in, in the month of January with a net profit. I think it's fair to say the two loss of operating days due to those snow cancellations at the beginning of January certainly uh, had played a role in, in this loss. Um, but through the month of January, we are operating a little over $5,000 behind our projected amounts that we would yield a break-even program. Um, we are hopeful, and it obviously continues to be a goal that we will make up this amount over the remaining five months, um, despite being behind. Mm -hmm. um, we have experienced an increase in average mail sold throughout the district by about 5%. Um, and I have been meeting, um, you know, frequently with uh, the chart rolls management team. I had meetings with Anna McGovern, the food service director, and Chris Callahan, the regional manager, um, over the break. Um, they invited their, their marketing uh, director in, um, who was actually in today, visiting all the schools and watching some, some of the, the lunch periods to provide some of his feedback and, and insight into the program. Uh, we are looking, we did make some changes to our, our vending uh, options to try to increase some additional revenue. And we are planning on incorporating a salad bar at the high school level um, as soon as possible, potentially as soon as the end of this week. Good to see if that would entice any some additional sales. So we are trying to look at what else is out there. Um, the catering piece continues to be key, I think, into to ordering the break even. So we're, we're hoping to continue to pursue those op opportunities aggressively. So although I, I, you know, I think it, although the $5,000 of behind schedule of break even program is, um, you know, somewhat um, concerning, but I think we'll be, I think we have opportunities to have good months in 
in March and May when we have a lot of operating days to make that up. Um, based on our new contract that we negotiated a couple of years ago, we do have some additional financial uh, protection in that contract if they don't achieve um, the the benchmark that we set forth at the beginning of the year up to $25,000. So there's some initial contractual protection in this one that helps ease where we're at um, at this point in the fiscal so year. So, Michael, that means if there is a deficit, so Wells will So all operating us? conditions remain the same, yeah. enrollment, and everything. we haven't had significant change, which we have not. Because we sat down and agreed upon a break-even program that went into the signed contract uh, renewal this year. Okay. If they were to lose anything between, I guess, zero and twenty-five thousand dollars, they would have to help us cover that amount. So we, they did make that commitment a few years ago when this contract went out to bid. Um, so that is some additional protection there. Um, I just have two two quick questions sure. and comments. Um, both of them around the out of district tuition cost. Sure. Just the comment is just um, when we start looking at the budget, I continue to think that's one of the biggest drivers of the budget and. I think it we is. want to make sure yeah. that we're really focusing on, like last year there was a position that we weren't able to get to try to focus on this and want to make mm -hmm. sure that we're thinking about that. And the question is circuit breaker. I've heard, seen a lot in the news yep. about yep. it not being funded Correct. efficiently. I mean, I know we had a few very large out of district placements last year. Yep. How is that impacting uh, us with regards to our budget? So it has had an impact. I think that's um, a lot of why you're seeing um, there not be a balance in that account this year because we, as we know, we've been able to exceed the amount we've forecasted in, in terms of you know, prepaying pre at the end of the year. Circuit Breaker was, we anticipated that being funded at 70%. We thought that was a conservative estimate at the time um, during last year during the budget process. We had hoped that would be fully funded at 75%. In the past, it's been not quite at 75, but 72 or 73. So it was a surprise to us as well as many other districts across the Commonwealth that that got funded at 65% at the start of this year. So um, that has been a topic um, of conversation at many of the, the um, affiliations, MASS, MASC, mm -hmm. as well as my affiliation, MASBO, and we've been advocating to the state representatives and so forth to push for additional um, you know, funding this current fiscal year to help bring that 65 to 75%. If that were to happen, North Reading would see about $80,000 in additional uh, funding. Um, and the way we, that, that impact actually impacts us kind of two years out. So we, we would really feel that impact in fiscal 19. So in our, you'll see in the preliminary budget um, that we will be presented at the next meeting on March 12th, and that's reflected in the budget books that were passed out this evening, that that is, is impacting that offset um, next year, which is, making that our district number a big driver, even a more of a driver in fiscal 19 than it has been because of that, that loss of, of, of additional revenue that we had anticipated. So we, we, are, we have received some um, hopeful news that yeah, that we'll, could be funded this year. Yes. We, we, we wrote to both Brad Jones and Bruce Tyron, I think received optimistic replies from yes. both, from both yeah. very yeah. thoughtful replies about their positions and their, I, I would use the word advocacy on Correct. Behalf of the fully full yeah. funding, yeah. we specifically spoke about where, how it would affect yeah. us in our, in our budget, and um, they were both. I would I would characterize it as very responsive. Very responsive. State's running far ahead on Correct. tax collections for yeah. fiscal, eighteen. Yep. So. so all reports is that is the case. Now they don't know how much of that is right. because of the prepayment right. situation. Well, but, so a lot of uh, I mean for the month of January, obviously, or the month of December, there was a lot of the prepayment, but right. I think Overall, even before that, the state favorable. was still running ahead. Right. Yeah. So we are hopeful, and fortunately, we have not been in a situation where we've had to rely on those funds in the in the current budgeted year. So we we're hopeful that that we'll see some positive news between now and in the end of the budget process to be able to make that adjustment and not see as much of a financial impact. But overall, we the we'll, the budgets were, were okay. Yeah, I think for this year, um, you know, we obviously have a little over a quarter left, you know, four months in the fiscal year remaining. I think, you know, things are are going okay. You know, we've had some unanticipated costs, which we've, we've dealt with in terms of mostly in the building grounds and the special education front. But, um, you know, we've taken that conservative approach, and I think we're in good um, 
stance with about four months to go to close out the fiscal year in good standing. And at this point, we're obviously hoping to do as much as we can within what we're legal able to do to you know, carry over carry funds forward. either in the form of prepayments to help the situation in fiscal in 2019. So you also have another report. And in, in, in order for you to um, prevent me from getting a really bad reputation of running selectman style four hour meetings, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we have to spend that long on this. I do want to say these quarterly reports are awesome. Um, this is a Michael's quarterly report on um, student activity Correct. funds and, and what the balances are of those funds. So if you want to. Yeah, so um, this is the second quarterly report that you received this year. This is part of our adherence to some of the new regulations of student activities where um, districts are now required to report out um, uh, at least quarterly or at least semi-annually, we, we decided to do a quarterly to school committees um, in regards to their, their status of all of their student activity um, accounts. So we have five accounts, five main checking accounts at each of the schools. So the, the report that's in your packet essentially includes the certified um, bank balances as of the end of uh, quarter two, which would be December 31st, really 2017. So we are now uh, reconciling, you know, working very well with the town treasurer's department and the town accounting office to receive bank statements timely and reconcile those bank statements with our accounting records and to cert actually start going through a process where we're certifying the bank balances quarterly. So as of 1231 in the memorandum that was included, you can, you'll notice what the um, certified bank balances were of each of the five school student activity accounts. There's an account at each, each school. Um, I included some, and then additionally, um, at the middle school and the high school where there's actually sub accounts because they're a little bit larger, um, I've included what those sub account balances were as well at the end of each quarter. Um, so some of the things I did speak to in the memorandum, particularly around the high school sub accounts, the high school is, you may, we did see a rise in the, particularly in the maskers sub account. So I just, I spoke with the maskers club, club advisor and just got some information on what's going on there. And um, I included some bullets in the memorandum that speaks to some of those, the reasons why you're seeing such a high account at this point in time. Um, they certainly had a very successful musical, Beauty and the Beast, in December, where they had just about you know, four sold-out shows. Um, you know, some of those expenses at the time we closed and certified on December 31st remain unpaid. So some of those have been paid, you know, over the last several weeks. Um, they also were involved in fundraising efforts for their trip to New York City, which will happen over the April school vacation week. So you start, we're actually starting to see a lot of those expenses roll in over these last several weeks. And they've also um, been making efforts to uh, be involved in some additional fundraising for a potential trip that may occur sometime in the future. Um, <coughs> so there's been some additional fundraising efforts going on by the students involved in this uh, club and activity, as well as the successful uh, musicals that they've had. Uh, in a lot of ways, since I think a lot of it, that's helped since coming to this to this campus, to this building, the, the beautiful Performing Arts Center, being what it is, they've been very successful these last couple of years. So it's certainly a conversation I've had with that club advisor to be aware of the balance. We don't, I don't, and we don't want to certainly see that continuing to grow. We want to put the money back into um, the program. And she does have some planned expenses coming forward, which I referenced some, some microphones and some, some monitors and speakers and support as, the re, as we move through this fiscal year. What kind of tax laws are there related to how much money we can keep in this kind of account, because 150,000 for the high school seems like a pretty high balance. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's nothing that I'm um, completely aware of in terms I, of. Uh, there's no limitations on. So what's what is recommended um, that in a school committee policy? Maybe we want to revisit this. And is that school committees are able to vote maximum balances in each account? Well, we we sort of talked about it, but we, we didn't set actual. Uh, limits the last time we kind of revised that policy right. and uh, they had a revamping of that this past summer. Um, this information, now that we're really doing a good job certifying the balances and tracking this on an ongoing basis and reporting out to the committee, um, I think it's something we probably should consider. <coughs> and I will say I've reached out to other districts um, that are similar in size and scope and 
the high school balance, it's not uncommon to see that balance be 125 to 150 because you know timing issues with senior prom collections or right. musicals or things things could tick up high for a period of time before things expenses or you know cash flow start coming out of the account yeah i, I mean I, I don't have a hard, I, I have i guess if they have expenses that they're you know gearing this toward then, <coughs> then that's one thing and, and maybe this balance will go down but i i just don't like seeing you know, $103,000, because we're collecting money, be it from students, be it from, they're out busking in Salem, the, you know, the mm -hmm. singing, sure and, know. you know, sure. and yeah. so I guess the money should be spent, is, is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think we have to certainly work towards, you know, watching these balances and yeah. making sure the money. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody else disagrees with me, but that's. I would, I would you agree. Know, just as we kind of want our PAs <laughs> right. to be, you know, if students are raising that money, it should be benefiting them. It should be, go, right, you know, exactly. So, I mean, that's I think idea. that's something that right. we should look into. Yep. Because I consider a, a Masquer's musical that students raising money. They're performing to raise money yep. for the Masquer's, and so it should be going back yeah. to the students. To wait, you know, three years out for right. a trip to Scotland, right. Right. these current the students that were there, high schoolers correct. are right. not going to be able They're to participate benefit, in. Right. And yeah, and I think it's something that I think we need to be aware of. I agree with everything you're saying. We need to work on making sure the money gets spent. Scott, I mean, balance doesn't grow. The, the the only counterpoint. I mean, I think of ticket sales a little bit different than if students are volunteering on the weekends for football games. I feel like I applaud the students for the amount of fundraising that they do. So I don't want to ever discourage somebody from fundraising. But I mean, I I, I agree in principle that it should be for the people that are raising it to benefit from it as well. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree. Any other questions for Michael on this? Uh, it's great that we get these quarterly. I think it's great for us to be updated um, and to know what what's going on. What's yeah. going on? Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Hey, thank you. Actually, what, one quick question for Michael: sure. budget timeline. Just because, <clears throat> I mean, I, yeah. I know we probably have it there. I mean, we just got it tonight. But is the yeah. next meeting going to be the first time people yep. are talking about so it? So we completed the preliminary recommended budget as an administrative team, kind of put the final touches of that over the February vacation week. We you know, went to print with the preliminary budget books. We will be publicly presenting the budget on uh, the, at the next meeting at, on March 12th, you know, probably time between 6.30 and 7 o'clock here mm -hmm. in, in this room. Um, at that point, we will make the, the budget document and the budget the budget presentation kind of public. We'll post that on our on our website. Um, Will it be posted before that meeting? I can, yeah, I'll probably post it prior to that meeting, the presentation and the book, so people have a chance to review that, and I'll, you know, I'll tweet those those postings out yeah, and make that it, yeah. available. Um, and so, the, so March 12th will be the first time the budget will be discussed publicly. Um, we will then hold a budget workshop with the school committee members, myself and John, and, we will uh, kind of dive into the budget, get start to get the feedback from the full committee. Um, the budget and um, finance subcommittee has had one meeting. I think we'll be fairly with late. one member. I want to <laughs> set another meeting date, probably yeah. sometime, you know, at either after March 12th or before March 12th, right. uh, to talk a little bit about it. And once it's released, you know, publicly, I want to start to digest that yeah. and have a meeting. Um, and then the next time we have a really you know, detailed public discussion on the budget will be the April 9th public hearing, which will take place at 6.30 in this room. Um, and then there'll be another budget workshop to see what other results are of, of any comments and dialogue that happens at that meeting. Um, and the budget's not due to be voted until the end of the month. I believe it's around April, April 30th time frame. Um, the school committee would actually vote the budget to, in time for the Tommy and Warren's articles. Um, but I think a lot of dialogue will certainly start to happen um, sometime between March 12th and um, you know April 30th on the on the budget. Um, we will I will continue to release some budget videos um, between you know March 12th and the time that the budget is voted. Um, and I think we also intend to actually pursue uh, to add to those budget videos. So I think uh, maybe at least another two you know short budget videos about the budget will be released. We also tend to advertise a webinar um, and invite members to uh, participate in a webinar. We'll probably do that following the budget presentation once it's released and the information is out there for a while. People that weren't able to attend some of the 
the public meetings will have an opportunity to participate in a webinar, which we'll um, be advertising, I think, in the near future when that will take place. So great. great. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Staffing, yeah, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I should have introduced Jill String to you all. I'm oh. sorry. Jill is working now for the transcript. You all know Mike. Yeah. But they're going to be kind of, I, my, my understanding from Maureen is that Jill is going to be covering more of our meetings, more of the school committee meetings, particularly during the budget season. And Michael's going to be doing some feature stories for the transcript, which okay. will include school department business, I, I imagine, too. So you might be seeing Jill. We're worried about that all night. I know, so I always no, I'm sorry. I, I always get nervous when people are taking. I thought a while. I thought of it a while ago that I should have introduced <laughs> Jill. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> I was getting nervous. I Okay, so staffing. This is a very typical meeting, by the way. No, it's not. We never go this long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blaming everybody. Well, we here haven't the last eight. couple of weeks. We, had a we haven't met for a while. So. The length of the meeting they haven't met for a while. really dependent on who's chairing. This, Please. So. <laughs> okay, staffing, we have nothing to report at this time. Bids and donations. Um, Julie, do you want to read those? or We have a lot tonight. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a school specialty gift certificate in the amount of $200 from the Reading Municipal Light Department to support Ms. Moore's art classroom at the Hood School. Second. Motion and second to approve the gift certificate from Reading Municipal Light Department. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation in the amount of $200 from Bas... <laughs> I'd say Baskaran Bas Natarajan, but that's okay. probably yeah. close. It's, it's yeah. Is that good? Oscar yeah. Natarajan. And Teresa Marie Chick to support expenses associated with North Reading's first robotics program. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? Overtime, Andy. Thank God you did to me. <laughs> you won? Overtime. Hockey team won four to three in overtime. Three. Okay. He's got a text from AJ. All right. Um, so we have a motion and second to approve this donation for the Robotics program, first robotics program. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? I'd well. like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $1,100 from the following middle <coughs> school parents. Daniel and Ruth Kennedy, Walker and Sheila McMahon, Ralph and Carrie DiNapoli, Rose Weld and Michael Dorrington, Jennifer and Brandon D, Mark and Janet Terranova, Lisa and David Supple, Heather Griffin, Julie and Greg Imbriano, Kimberly and Derek Howe, Marie and Patrick Tucker, Nancy and Kenneth Carpenter, Rebecca and Jeremy Shore, to offset costs for the eighth grade Washington, D.C. trip. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? I take the motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $570 from Samuel and Rachel Fisher, William and Gina McLaughlin, Colleen and Neil Steinmeier, and Carmine Pes Petrosino to offset the costs associated with the eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah. Second. For the discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Unanimous? I to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a $7,000 donation from the North Reading Diamond Club for the purpose of making improvements to the batting cage complex mm -hmm. for use by the baseball and softball programs at NRHS. Second. And I'd like to give uh, Mr. Venezia credit here for working on this one and, and help helping to get this done and working to make sure that both the softball and baseball teams will have equal access to this facility. Yeah, I want to credit uh, Frank Carey and the Diamond Club because very generously doing this for both teams, right. softball and baseball. Uh, I was down there today. It's under construction. <laughs> they're already they're already started working. Uh, are they back on schedule, John? Or? Uh, I've asked them to hold off. A okay, there's bit. a couple of things with yeah. Uh, we, I think they're. I think they're very <laughs> well, and we also don't want to complicate. The Is delivery. Frank operating the well, backhoe? <laughs> the delivery well, of the concessions. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. We're going to get the concession oh, yeah. stand delivered March first. Right. Uh, right. But they've uh, they've started down there. They have. They've done. They've done some. So was that equipment there theirs today that I saw? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, so it was. wasn't. I got it's excited because I thought. Hiking trees. Oh, because I thought I was excited because I thought maybe the concession stand was. But it was a very generous offer, and they haven't blown anything up or anything. So. Okay. So we have a motion and a second for seven thousand from the North Rain Diamond Club. Any. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? 
I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a $7,000 donation from the Hornet Hall of Fame for the purpose of making improvements to the batter cage complex mm -hmm. for baseball and softball programs at NRHS. Okay. So it's another $7,000 just from, from the Hornet Hall of Fame. Them. They've been generous. Yep. They've been really generous. They have a plaque up too in the, uh, yep. in the <laughs> display case. But they've done. They've, they've spent a lot. They of have money between that between this and the uh, the money they put into the field. Fields. And, yep. So we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Next we have subcommittee updates. Uh, athletic subcommittee, Mr. Venezia. Uh, we discussed again, uh, and I'm not going to repeat it, but we did talk about the uh, co-op hockey team. Uh, and the expenses, and we got some numbers from, I think, the athletic director <coughs> who uh, um, provided those to us. Uh, we also, I think, talked about the balances we always do in the revolving account. I think we're looking at an anticipated carry over, might correct me if I'm wrong, around $17,000. Yep. Um, I think we talked about field maintenance, uh, and I, I don't have a whole lot of notes beyond that, to be honest with you. Do you remember what else we talked about there? No, I think that was. We talked again about uh, the priorities. Uh, for the softball field, yeah. trying to get the dugout enclosures. We haven't had a lot of luck in finding anything that's affordable. Right. Yeah, it's um, been. Dugout enclosures and scoreboards, right? And the scoreboard, yeah. yeah. So those are still on the priority list, but we haven't really come across the funding part. There, there, um, I know you softball has done some fundraisers, and they're making some improvements at the little, little school, school facility, yeah. which is good. That benefits uh, us right. as well as the uh, youth softball program. Anything else, John, that we had on that? We had a, a, the, the update on the um, facility, the concession stand laboratory yeah. oh, facility. Yeah. We which shared, a, shared an update on the progress. Of we saw pictures, too. Which yeah, the pictures, yeah, it, it looks great. The pictures, pictures look really good. On schedule and followed up with uh, CDI, and we're expecting a delivery in early March. Right. So. When will it be up and functioning? It's supposed to be March 16th. March 16th is the date Just we have. It, it won't be finished, though, because the... Uh, Hot top plants aren't open, so they can't do the finish work and the Some landscaping. landscaping. But, the, but the building itself yeah. is supposed to, that that portion of the right, except, except for the right. asphalt, is supposed to be done by March 15th. Yeah. It looks uh, nice. <clears throat> I think that was pretty much. Yeah, it. yeah, that, that yeah. wasn't good. Well, a I had one years. question. Numbers weren't there, so I think yeah. it was a. Yeah, Rita wasn't there. Rita one wasn't question there. related to the advertising policy we approved tonight. Does that preclude us if a vendor, if, if a company came and said they wanted to donate a school board and would put their name up there, how would we, we couldn't do that, right? Change our policy. <coughs> we made it, we changed it. Yeah, I don't know that it precludes. Well, no, I think there, I, I actually think there's a different. Is there another policy? There's other policies that don't deal with advertising, but deal with sponsorships. Sponsorship, yeah. So I because think there, there are other policies that would allow that. That continues to be my dream here, that someone or some ones step forward with businesses and help us to get a school right. board. A yes. Well, we actually have another sponsorship one, which deals with the the, the advertising we have it on the grants. Right, there. correct. correct. Yeah, Correct. so the, there, there are policies that would allow okay. that. We were just talking more about bigger advertising, banners on on, on uh, okay. fences, things like that. All right. Um, NORCAM, anything to report, Scott? Um, I mean, I, I missed the January 25th one when I was traveling, the February 22nd. The only thing I'd, I'd mention is the uh, they mentioned the the technical difficulties for the, I don't know if you watched the live one from the bachelor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I think you were texting. I was, all of us. Yes, I was texting you. <laughs> I can't hear anything. Um, uh, apparently that uh, I think it was fine on the tape version, but that was something they they were going to look into, but and try to make sure that it's working at the other at the little in the yeah. right in the hood before we go. You know, Mr. Bernard has been working. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Julie, you met with the budget subcommittee. Anything to so report? So we met. We looked at the preliminary budget, which I assume is in here. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. So I mean, it's right. nothing. Okay. So and we will we'll set up another meeting that I can participate in after all, the. All complaints should be directed to you. Yeah. All the budget complaints. Policy. We went over all that tonight. Correct. Uh, the only other thing to mention is there's um, a NAR. Is it NARCAM? Oh, NARCAM policy. Yeah, yeah. we're we're going to be working on that. So hopefully we'll have a revision of that soon to look at and I think we've gotten through the whole 99 there's a couple of outstanding ones that we're doing follow-up work on but okay and we still yeah. have the ones that we need to delete there were a few that we needed to do some legal reference checks yep. and yeah but yeah pretty much by the time we get yeah. done they'll have a new 99 that come out right a couple of them. they're already coming out now so yeah, yeah. but certainly the bulk of the work is done Evaluation subcommittee, we have a t two timelines for our school committee self-evaluation for the superintendent's mid-cycle 
valuation presentation. I assume they speak for themselves. Or is there anything we need to? What's the timeline on that, Mel? It's the uh, packet here, Jerry. Let's Jerry, see. sorry, you'll have to participate in should both. Be of way them. at the back. <laughs> Are they at still? The oh, yeah, Jerry, yeah. there. Be Jerry, you'll be here for both of them. Uh, well, all concludes by April 30th. Yeah. So I thank this uh, subcommittee for coming up with these. Do we have anything? So Hold on, Julie wants to. Sorry. So the the school committee self-assessment is staying the same as it's been right. in the past. Yep. Um, those will come to me. I believe it's April 9th. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you'll start working on them. And okay. Get them back to us. As far as the superintendent evaluation, because John is on a two-year cycle, we discussed that there was not a need to complete the full DESE oh, evaluation yes. tool. Summative evaluation. Because okay. that is based, his goals are now two-year goals. Okay. So that tool is really not necessarily, you know, because he's still in the midst of his at least first year now, mm -hmm. he has addition, an additional year. So we were contemplating, you know, creating something that we can do some sort of assessment, but perhaps not in that formal okay. way. Oh, that's very <laughs> so this is what you're proposing? This looks good to me. I mean, it, it's a good, it's a mid-cycle. John, you're okay with this? I was open to, it was really driven by the subcommittee. No, but, I think, it, but it's, this yes, seems to make sense. I am. I like it now. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you, subcommittee, for putting this together because we need to keep on top of these things. It comes Anything else, doesn't it? Sure. It's hard okay. to believe that it's like here again. Um, finance planning team. Uh, Mr. Venezia and I attended, mostly um, focused. We talked about the budget. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot more money. Um, we didn't hear about a lot more money coming, a little bit more, but. Um, we still have a really significant hole to dig out of. Well, things get worse, too. I mean, we, we found out that uh, there's going to be potentially a 14% increase in oh, right. Blue Cross Blue Shield right. uh, costs. Uh, I'm sure that's high. Yeah. But we also found out there's going to be a 25 potentially 25% increase in the trash right. uh, costs as well, trash pickup. Uh, I think they're working on it, though, uh, trying to do something. I mean, they're hoping to try to get something creative yeah, to yeah, avoid. Yeah. So I things are going up all over. Right. A question on the Blue Cross. Didn't we join some kind of... We have a... Uh, and it was... We didn't? PFI. Yeah. But the primary... PFI. But still, this is from Blue Cross. Blue Cross Blue Shield. So th the Blue Cross is still providing the insurance. Right. We're getting underwritten, basically, by another company so that's... Reduce the cost. Reducing the cost right. for participants to help pay their deductibles and uh, whatever. But that Blue Cross is still... It could be Blue offset cross. by so the so our costs and then potentially workers' costs would right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 70, you know. 30, yeah. Right. Yeah. Seventy thirty would be divided. Mr. Bernard, Did, are you folk? There's an insurance advisory committee meeting at four o'clock on Thursday. I am planning okay. to go. Okay. Oh, so. And I think the revenue plan that we saw wasn't very very much updated. No. It's still showing us with a level services uh, budget that's well in excess of a million. A million and a half. Dollars. Right. Over budget. Is it a million and a half or a million? million. Well, I think a million and a half but was. I'm sorry. I think it's a million, 1.6 million total, wasn't it? I don't remember. The, the level of services was just under a million. Right. And our recommended budget was a little over 1.2. Yeah, the recommended budget was yeah. 1.2. And um, the, the town has also uh, taken some budget, budget initiatives from their department. The town, has, the town has a, also has a bigger deficit this year than they've had in the past. Right. So it's, right now, it's a, it's a difficult picture. It always gets a little better, but I don't know how bright it's going to get. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of good news coming I mean, out the Chapter that. 70 we're getting is basically $20 per student, right. so it's not going to help us get out of any holes. It's like $48,000 or right. something like that. Right. So, and we're not getting any help in terms of insurance costs because of where we are already in terms of how much money we get from the state, right. correct? Yeah, correct. To cover not insurance qualifying costs. qualifying for that. Right. <clears throat> the additional money that they've increased in the foundation budget for. Yep. There's some new growth on the Berry property tax wise. Right, we'll get some. It's not as much as we thought initially. Right. Yeah. Initially, it's minimal because they're just, we're getting taxed, they're getting taxed on the land pulte. Right. As soon as they start building homes and selling them, building condo, we'll, we'll get more money, the town will get more money. Yeah, it'll definitely be a windfall at some point. Yeah. Okay, subcommittee update. Athletic subcommittee meets tomorrow at 12.30. Budgets committee, subcommittee, we need to set a meeting. Policy subcommittee, my favorite subcommittee, meets March 9th at 7 a.m. 
That's um, it. No, if anybody that's interested, we've moved it to March 16th. Correct. Oh, okay, March 16th. It happened. Another thing. Because I was thinking of coming. So. Yeah, where is it again? Yeah, <laughs> March 16th at 7 a.m. Um, NORCAM is March 22nd at 7. Finance planning team March 20th at 8:15. Evaluation sub April 11th. SSBC is undetermined at this time. There will be another SSBC meeting at some point. Correct. Administrative report, Mr. Bernard. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So I gave you all a packet tonight, just three things I wanted to highlight for you. On February 16th, I disseminated my winter newsletter um, across the district, and I just gave a printed copy for all of you here uh, for your reading pleasure tonight. Um, North Reading Public Schools Parent University, I'm very excited about where things are with um, our progress to host our first uh, parent, parent <coughs> university event on Saturday, April 7th. I will very soon be sending out a, um, an informational email with a sign-up link for folks that are interested in attending. Um, and what I've given to you here tonight is the final uh, set of workshops that will be offered on that day. Um, the only change that would be made to this, if you look on the next to the last page, just the before the, the, before the sponsor page, the information pavilion, that's um, a part of the program that we're going to have on Main Street with um, kind of short snippets of things that are going on across the town and in the schools that people can visit uh, in between attending their concurrent workshops for the day. So a lot of good work has gone on um, over the last mm, seven or eight months leading up to Parent University. We've never done something like this in North Reading, so I'm very excited about it, and I thought you might like to get a little early glimpse into what some of the workshops are to be offered. And then the last thing I have for you is, um, I think this practice started a few years ago with providing the committee with um, a report of the mid-year update on each of the school's um, school councils to meet the established goals of their school improvement plan, so I'm providing you with, um, with this year's update um, as part of the packet. Just quickly, since we haven't been here long enough tonight, um, I do want to call out in John's newsletter, uh, you know, these scores go up and down. We're not always going to be at the top. But, uh, you know, in a comparison of our 2017 SAT results with uh, Hamilton, Wenham, Swampscott, Masco, North Andover, Rockport, Wakefield, and Linfield, um, North Reading is, um, was second in uh, evidence-based reading and writing mean score, second to only uh, Hamilton, Wenham. And in math, we were right, um, also right at the top, near the top, or in the middle with, with these the same top, districts. Right at the top. Yeah, at the top. So 571 um, for right math. So, um, or excuse me, 583 for math. So we're doing extremely well, Mr. Bernard. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up. I, I, I didn't want to call out anything specific in the newsletter, but since you did, I, I, I was interested because it was the new SAT, and we, it was our first full, time, uh, full year of results when we felt we, we could um, say confidently that all of the students that were being measured in our, in our, rep our, school individual, our school's individual report. But I was curious, is what, you know, that data really didn't have a frame of reference for me, so we did a little bit of comparison work with some of our peer communities to get a sense of you know, how well did we in fact do, how well did our students do. So this just because it was new information, I thought it was interesting to share. I think from this point forward, I would probably give the traditional right. comparison data, but because it was the first year of the new data, I thought oh, this, really this gave it a little different view, yeah. so thank you. And John, I sound like a broken record, but the newsletter is unbelievable. It's very really extremely like informative, it's and it's interesting. Can you imagine he's putting out an interesting newsletter? <laughs> And I'm serious. I'm serious. This is unbelievable, the stuff that's in there. Well, I get help. Michael always shares an article. Yeah, there's I've some other. Digital Learning. Dan, Dan Downs, Downs has an Patrick, article in there. So. The book of the month. Um, well, I don't know. I never I look read, at that. <laughs> the, books he, the books he reads, I'm not interested in, but everything else. No, it's really, that's very good. That is good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, correspondence, nothing at this time. No, sir. Future business, we have um, our next regular meeting is March 12th at the here will, will be the preliminary budget presentation. Um, if anybody, I recommend people come out if they want to hear what's going on with the budget. Uh, March 22nd in the superintendent's conference room, we have a budget workshop. That's at 3.30 in the afternoon. March 26th, we'll have our regular meeting at the Hood School. And then April 9th, we will have our 2019 public budget hearing and regular meeting here. Um, anything else? Julie, I think Julie had an item. Uh, I just wanted to, to ask a couple questions about where we are with kindergarten enrollment. I've been hearing a lot of questions from 
some parents and if you could just give us a quick update so we're in the know. Yeah, I can. Um, kindergarten is, I would say, kind of an evolving thing each year. Um, right now, where we are is, just give me one second, I'll have a little. It's looking like, I think these numbers are fairly current. Well, let me back up a little bit if I could. So once following the um, orientation for parents of prospective students and then the registration, what, what happens is the Administrative Council comes to get together shortly after that registration period to kind of look at the numbers and make some hard decisions around, you know, where, where is kindergarten, kindergarten going to take place at, at each school and, and what's it going to look like, okay? How many sections? Mm -hmm. Um, we have, I think at that time, you know, I'm talking like the late January, early February, we have a pretty good sense of the registrations have, you know, being near complete. You know, you may get a few that come in for a variety of reasons, a move in, for example, or something like that, a late registration or something, you know, but those are, those are minimal examples. And so what we then do um, is come together, make those decisions collectively about what we think is, is best um, for the district. And, and we... You know, I think it's it's fair to say we work pretty painstakingly over the next several weeks because things do change and they change, you know, again, it could be a family that moves in or out, a person, a family that changes their mind that wanted half day, wants full day or, or vice versa, um, retentions, potential retentions of students. So the numbers change, but I wouldn't, you know, I don't want to make it sound like they change all that dramatically. But in any case, um, and Michael has some data here, I think, too, on his computer, but it looks like where we are right now is um, three sections of full-day kindergarten running at the Batchelder School. This is projected for September. Three at the Hood School and one at the Little School, so for a total of seven. And our enrollment looks to be down from where we were last year by approximately 40 students, right? Yes. Am I right, right? 40, yeah. 42 students or so. So there is a, there is a you know, in our, again, this is, this is where we are today. But I think I want to be very exact in saying to you that we continue to look at this at virtually every administrative council meeting now, yeah. from now That's until right. you know the end of the school year, because there are, are those possibilities of, 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 of modifications based on people's you know changing in, in their plans. So where we are right now is it, it looks like the um, the one uh, section at the little school that we would be offering is going to necessitate. Um, a number of students, a number of families having to, if they want to take the full day kindergarten, that their, their children would have to go to the Hood School. And I think that number, again, please don't quote me, but I believe it's four or five, okay? And the decision got made on that from uh, trying to minimize the impact, you know, on the number of families that would be affected if, if, there, was a, if there were to be families to be moved. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where things stand today. But as I said, it's really a standing item uh, agenda on the item, standing item on the agenda for administrative council meetings for the next couple of months. How about half day sections? Do we have a breakdown of that? Uh, let's see. I don't have that here, Michael. Is the little school a hybrid? We were the idea I think was it's going to have to be if there's only one course. That's yeah. That's I'm wondering. Small half day numbers. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Say that. So, the idea is that we would actually be combining all the half day and the full day uh, sections. So they'd all be hybrid, here. they'd be hybrid. We would all, this Correct. would be a district-wide sort of hybrid model. At all three schools. Um, in large part, the half day numbers were just kind of very low you know, this year. Um, so it just provided that kind of opportunity to- So every full day yeah. classroom would be a hybrid? Correct. Correct. Okay. Oh, the humanity. There were, there were only 25 half day registrations across all three uh, schools. Across all three schools. Right. So Right. So that makes it impossible. So again, so. you know, and, and I, I just, I think it's important to remind people of where we were just a few short years ago, where there were, there were often scores of families that were told that they did not have a full day spot if they wanted that. And I think the committee saw that that was not a situation they liked. Um, I think it might have even been my first year, because I remember, if it wasn't my first year, it was my second year. So it would have either been 14, 15, or 15, 16. But I remember in my first year as superintendent meeting with, with kindergarten families at the old, the old high school when my office was down there to kind of retool the website and make, you know, we, we went through that process of, I think, information gathering and then what was the best information to put out. And along with that was the commitment that we would do um, 
what we could do, reasonably speaking, to accommodate every family's request to have full day kindergarten, knowing that there might not be families that got the spot in their in their home dis in their home school, so to speak. And that morphed into the the idea of the hybrid model, which we are now in year two of. Um, and it's gone, in my opinion. I you know I have no indications to think we did a survey in year one and had you know very little negative feedback. In fact, I think we might have had one comment very early on in the semester, and then that person chose chose to change their feedback because it went so well. And I think this year has been you know uneventful. But the reality of it is, unfortunately, we are not able to accommodate everybody um, in their home school this year. It means I think it's I think it's five families at this point. It might be four. It's because of the way the numbers work. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And, and, it, to, and to keep to maintain a class size right. that we right. felt we could we could you know that we could appropriately fund given right. some of the other restrictions that we have on the budget. And just to clarify one one thing, I mean I think. It was great that the committee and the administration wanted to offer full day to everybody. And then the hybrid, just to remind people, the whole idea of the hybrid was to balance class sizes and to keep more people in the district that they're, they would, the school that they would be in because otherwise the full day class was capping out. The half day class wasn't even a full class and students were being told they have to go to another, another school. So the hybrid was, again, it was balancing the needs to try to keep more people in the, you know, around the school they were going to and balance the class sizes so it wasn't 10 in one classroom and 20 in the other right. classroom. So. Does that mm -hmm. answer your, okay. Thank you for, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak about it because I have gotten calls <clears throat> and I know some of you may have too, yep. but I, I definitely did. One. Um, and I've, I've, I've returned every one of those calls and, and, or, or emails, you know, to, and given the best information I can. And I've also, I've, I've made it clear that, you know, things can change, you know, and, I, and it's, I'm sincere when I say that because, you know, my, my, my history shows that circumstances change for families and sometimes a spot opens that we yeah. didn't anticipate was going to open, so. Right. Exactly, yeah, right. And so it's sometimes, I mean, I, I I know that it, it could be late in the spring, you know, near the end of the school year that sometimes a family is, is wondering, you know, that it might be on a wait list, which is a very, it's a very small wait list right now. But you know what, for those families, it doesn't matter how, sh how long or short the wait list is, it's, it's their situation and that's the one that's most important to them and I get that. I assume there'll have to be some shifting of staff to accommodate this. There is, there is that possibility in, in one case, yes. Yep, there is. As of today, yeah. Scott, the only other topic I would say, which isn't really a school committee issue. Is a record tonight or what? Yes, but just <laughs> as you know, there is an open position. There, are, there are two open seats for the school committee. If anybody is actually still watching this, they sh they are the type of people that should apply and, and should should pull papers and try to go for this. Gosh, Mr. Yeah. Delaney will run otherwise. Clearly, but. he has nothing to do. <laughs> yeah. But if anybody had, if, if anybody is watching this and really does have questions, I think everybody on the committee be, would be welcome to talk about what the role is. And you know, we do need people to serve in all positions in North Reading. And so, if people are interested, reach out to us. Now I have good news. Uh, We've only been here since 5.30, and uh, now at this point, I would request uh, a vote to go into a brief executive session for the purpose of discussing collective bargaining. Is it here? Yeah, we can do it here, yeah. So moved. Motion by Julie. We have a second? Second. Second by Janine. Scott? Cindy, you got Jerry? Aye. Janine? Aye. Cindy? Aye. Cindy? Hey, thanks for coming, this. Mr. Delaney. Are you recording that?